Good morning. Today is April 24, 2003. I'm Harry Ziegler, a volunteer at the Palm Springs Air Museum here in California. Part of our mission is to record and preserve the history of World War II in conjunction with the Veterans Oral History Project of the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. We conduct interviews of veterans and civilians who participate in our country's military conflicts. Today I'm here <clears throat> along with fellow volunteer Dave Thompson. Today we have the honor and the privilege of interviewing Charles Miller, who was in the Army Air Corps during World War II. So nice to have you here, Charles. Thank you very much. What we'd like to start off with is how your family got to America. <laughs> If you can review that a little for us. My family came to America on a lot of different boats. Uh, the, uh, uh, early on, <laughs> we had a gentleman by the name of Edward Doty that came over on the Mayflower, uh, which uh, as a young person, I was led to believe that having an ancestor on the Mayflower was a very good thing. However, uh, further research I found later on that Edward Doty was a little bit of a troublemaker. and. Uh, he, uh, he was the first person to be disciplined out of the Mayflower Compact group uh, and was banned to the woods for two weeks after they had landed in, Mass in the Massachusetts area. Uh, Edward Doty is kind of interesting because he is the father of all the Dotys in the United States. And if you ever run into a person named Doty and ask him about his ancestry, they'll tell you about this gentleman who, uh, who, who had gotten in difficulty coming over on the Mayflower. Uh, more recently, uh, the uh, German side of my family came over about 1840 or, or 1845. Uh, they came from the southern part of Germany, and that family we've maintained contact with over the years. So I've even visited their home, uh, their homes in Germany. Uh, the, uh, the name Miller was originally Muller, an U with the umlaut, M-U-L-L-E-R, and it was anglicized uh, when they landed in, in New York. Now, was it a trade name or just a name? I mean, did it, like uh, Schumacher, did it have a, a, a name that would reflect what you did? Actually, uh, uh, my family in Germany uh, were, uh, were vintners, and they raised grapes and made wine. So, no, it was not a trade name in that sense. Well, my last name is Ziegler, and that was a bricklayer or a tile setter in Germany. Um, so, where did your father and mother then get together? Well, <clears throat> my father's family uh, were farming in New Jersey, and uh, my father came from a rather large family, ten children. Uh, he was the first member of the family to go to college. And had trained as a carpenter, and uh, his uh, church organization uh, provided him with a scholarship to go to Rutgers University. Uh, he attended there, and following his graduation, he was offered a job teaching at Iowa State College in Ames, Iowa. So he went to that location, and he met my mother, who was a student at the school, and my mother had grown up in western Iowa, uh, just about 30 miles east of Council Bluffs. Uh, they, uh, <laughs> uh, they spent their entire married lives in, in Ames, raised a family of five children. Uh, my father originally uh, taught at the university and then found out that he couldn't make money doing that, not enough money to educate his own children, so he quit and went into business. He had a rental real estate business, which uh, was good at one point in time, but during the Depression years, when I was growing up, uh, they were very hard strapped for money in order to keep from going bankrupt. So uh, we we were uh, we we held quite a bit of land, but we did not live in a very wealthy manner. So, roughly, um, can you remember back what it was like in the Depression, being a Depression? child? Very clearly I can remember those things. There was not money for anything. Uh, as a matter of fact, if, uh, uh, 
uh, because of, <coughs> of the needs of the business, why, as a very young boy, why I went to work and, and did many chores. Uh, by the time I was in junior high school, uh, I would get up at 5 or 5.30 in the morning and fire the steam boilers that, that heated uh, some of the apartment houses and buildings. Uh, and if I wanted spending money, I was expected to go out and, and develop that on my own. I had a paper route. I, I cleaned the offices for some dentists in the, in the community and uh, found various and sundry ways to, to collect money from Coke bottles and, and, uh, and minor chores. But I, uh, I always was able to manage to get the things that, uh, that I really wanted badly. Now, how many siblings were in your family? I had, I had three sisters and a brother and we were quite widely scattered in age. My older brother is seven years older than I am, and uh, my, uh, uh, my youngest sister is 12 years younger than I am. So was it expected for all members of the families to work, or were the girls pretty much homebound? Uh, being at home didn't exempt you from work in our family because we ran the business out of our home. Uh, so no, everybody in our family worked, and. And I have to say that we certainly, we certainly had a good education at home, and in the matter of getting jobs done, everybody in my family knows how to accomplish things. So, did you go through grade school and high school in Ames? Yes, I did. And then, um, your brothers and sisters all did the same thing. That's correct. And then, you mentioned the other day that you ran into a program that Ford Motor had about driving. What was that story? <laughs> <laughs> when, when I was in high school, I had always had an interest in gasoline engines and automobiles. Anything mechanical was uh, was of great interest to me. Uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, uh, when uh, when I was about 12, 11 years old, when I was eleven years old, I built a go kart using a one cylinder Maytag gasoline engine. Which, uh, which incidentally, I had purchased purchased the engine uh, in non-working condition for a total sum of seventy-eight cents. And uh, and by the time I was about fifteen years of age, I had the opportunity to to get the engine for an, an American Austin automobile, which was all in parts in a box. And I assembled it and got it running. And then I had to get the rest of the parts to put an automobile together, which I did and the car was eventually licensed uh, and, uh, and through high school I had this but of course I had the problem of, uh, of earning enough money to keep, it, to keep it going also. Was there such a thing as automobile insurance in those days? As a matter of fact my first state farm policy I believe was in 1940 or 41. On your car? On my American Austin automobile. Was there another family car then? How did? Yes. Well, my father, uh, because he was operating uh, operating rental real estate property, we had uh, we did have a family car which he used for his business primarily, and we also had a 1932 Ford pickup truck, uh, which uh, which I was expected to use to uh, haul the uh, trash to the dump from apartment houses and places like that. We also. Uh, furnished all of the places that we had, so it meant moving furniture and making repairs on properties, and, uh, and I, uh, I used the Ford pickup truck. It carried an aura of garbage that you can't imagine, and <laughs> it was kind of a bad Friday night when I had to use it to take my date out because I didn't have anything else because <laughs> there was no way to make it smell right. Now, we were talking about this Ford driving program. Yes, How that's did that where come we started. About? Well, uh, uh, when I saw that the Ford Motor Company had a, a driving contest in progress, I became interested. Uh, you had to write an essay, something about automobiles and, and uh, driving, and then you had to pass a driving test, which included a variety of acceleration and, and stopping feats and parallel parking and all of the usual things that you would expect. And uh, uh, I 
I won the local contest and I advanced then onto the state contest. I was one of the five state finalists in the contest. And I did not win it, but I got something even better, and that is I got the attention of a professor who was involved in promoting driver education at Iowa State College. Uh, and uh, he, uh, he asked me if I would come and help out work in his programs. He had research projects going. And about that time, they had talked about putting a civilian defense group together, and they wanted us to train people to drive ambulances. So I worked in the ambulance driving uh, program also. He gave me the opportunity to put together a lecture series on, on just how engines and transmissions and differentials work in automobiles and present that to school teachers who came to Iowa State College to, to become driving instructors over the summer. Uh, this was a, this was a, a great thing in, in propelling me forward in, in many of the things that I wanted to do. Now, what grade in high school would this have been? Oh, I would have been uh, I would have been a junior in high school when this started, and, and I did some of this through my senior year. Now, did you have time for any athletics? Uh, very little at that point in time. I, a little earlier, I had done some things. I, I played on the tennis team when I was in the ninth grade, and and uh, at one point in time, I thought football would be fun, but I found I wasn't very well qualified for it, <laughs> and, and so uh, uh, I. Uh, I, I did run on, on the track team briefly, uh, and when I got to college, I, uh, I ran cross country for that. I was in college for one year, one year of uh, academics before I went in service, and I did run on the track, on the cross country team at that time. Now, was the college there at Ames? Yes. So, which would have been what college? Iowa State College. And uh, your brother now, how is What's he doing? Seven years older than you. Well, my brother, uh, my brother had a little difficulty making his decision what he was going to do. He started in engineering at Iowa State College, and uh, he switched and got a degree in economics, and finally decided to go to law school. He practiced law for over fifty years in Iowa and just retired uh, a little over a year ago. So, you go to college then. And are your mother and dad in good health at this time? Oh, yes. And uh, the uh, sisters, I'm assuming, then are cleaning apartments and... Oh, they're doing all these Doing things. all these things. Absolutely. And, uh, but you are, you live in town. You're town kids. That's right. And so there's a bus system and other ways to get around if uh, there's no car. Or, or a bicycle or two feet. A bicycle, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so where are you? Then in your college uh, years, when Pearl Harbor's attacked. Well, actually, Pearl Harbor occurred when I was still in high school, uh, my senior year in high school. Okay. And as a matter of fact, uh, the uh, you ask about athletics and so on. I was interested in dramatics when I was in high school, and I appeared in all of the various plays that they put on. Uh, and on the seventh of December. Uh, there, our dramatics coach, L. Wayne Smith, uh, had asked me to come with some others down to the high school to, to build the scenery for the senior class play. So on Sunday morning, December 7th, uh, my, because th this was a requirement in my home also, went to church uh, at the local Presbyterian church and uh, met with a couple of my other friends whose mothers also required that they go to church and we served as ushers and then while the while the preacher was talking we went back to the church office and exchanged stories which was our usual routine for Sunday morning and after that was over and I had had my lunch at home went to the high school and met Al Hausrath and Bill Winlock and several other uh, of the group and we were building flats, which are the, uh, the big wooden frameworks that are covered with fabric and then painted for use 
uh, on, on the stage. Uh, we were in the in the midst of a lot of this activity. We had the, the radio playing music in the background. The radio was interrupted, the music was interrupted, and the announcer came came out to say that we had uh, been attacked by the Japanese at Pearl Harbor. Of course, none of us really were very aware of exactly where Pearl Harbor was, except we thought it had something to do with the, Hawaii, with the Hawaiian Islands. And, uh, <coughs> and I recall that our first concern uh, was whether they would close the high school, and whether we would, uh, whether we would be allowed to continue our education. And uh, Mr. Smith uh, assured us that, uh, that there's no way that a war would interfere with are finishing our high school educations, but then we, uh, in the coming days, we realized that having an education might be kind of important to being in service, and uh, my friend Carol Diverson, who was one of the ushers at church with me, had made the decision. He quit high school because he had the required subjects. He quit high school and entered college. And he had an arrangement with the high school that his credits from college would be transferred back so he could graduate with our class, and that would give him an extra half year of college uh, before, uh, uh, before the time that he would likely end up in the military. Uh, I finished out my high school, but I immediately enrolled in college in June of 1942. And, uh, went through the summer session in the fall. I completed about uh, about one year of college credits uh, when the draft was coming down hard on me and, and uh, indicated that, uh, that I would have to be going one way or another. I had the choice. I was in engineering and I found out that while I liked the mathematics and some of those things, I wasn't very wild about <laughs> the engineering drawing laboratories and the things where we were put aside for perhaps three or four hours at a time and told that we were not allowed to talk to anybody while we were working on these things. Uh, in fact, I decided that if that's what the job was likely to be when I got out of engineering school that I didn't want it. And uh, so <laughs> rather than sign, go into V5 or V12 programs, which would have kept kept me in college, I had wanted to fly very badly, and uh, so I proceeded to investigate uh, getting in first into the Navy Air Corps, and they told me I had a perforation of the eardrum and wouldn't be able to get in. So I got another opinion from the Army Air Corps. They said that I only had a scar and that I was okay. So that's the reason I ended up in the Army Air Corps. Well, prior to hearing this attack on Pearl Harbor, were there any premonitions in a college town that things weren't going well as far as Japan and, and Germany and our possibility of getting into the war? Uh, actually, uh, very much so. It was the talk of the town at all times. Uh, late, uh, late in the 1930s, uh, we had material at school. Uh, about this. I read the local newspaper, the articles that uh, came out about uh, what Hitler was doing in Germany and, and what was going on in Japan, and in particular we were incensed by the behavior of the Japanese in China and the rape of Nanking, various episodes. In 1939, I had been working during the summer, uh, and uh, at the end of the summer, <coughs> my brother told me he'd like to take me down to the state fair in Des Moines, 35 miles away for a day. He thought it'd be a lot of fun. So we, we went there. Uh, it, was the, it was the first day of September, 1939. We went to the Midway, played games. We went to a dance hall and danced. We had tickets for the, for the big evening show, which featured Paul Whiteman and his orchestra. And in the middle of Paul Whiteman's rendering of one of my favorite songs, Stairway to the Stars, they interrupted the song to say that Germany had marched into Poland and that the European war was underway. Now from that time on, it was a matter of 
how much are we going to be involved in this? And of course, there were many people that were opposed to it. Charles Lindbergh, for one, spoke in Des Moines uh, during this period of time, uh, said that we were uh, that we were not prepared for war, that the Germans had a far better war machine, that the war in Europe was none of our business, and we should stay out of it. But the thing that really upset some people was, he said, Hitler isn't entirely bad. He's done some social things in Germany that look awfully good. This angered President Roosevelt enough that he took his, his commission away from him. He had been a, a colonel in the Air Corps, and he lost his commission, and he was never given it, given it back during World War II. Now, <clears throat> were there things about China and Japan at the same time being discussed? Absolutely. Uh, the <clears throat> most of the churches had missions in China back before World War II, and uh, and we were we were big fans of Chiang Kai Shek, who was trying to pull the various factions together in China and, uh, and uh, make it possible to defend against the Japanese who were, uh, who were pursuing uh, conquest of China a piece at a time. And in Nanking, China, why the Japanese atrocities there were widely publicized. We also had the question about whether America should be rearming or not. And, uh, there was a, a, there were a group of lawmakers in Washington, very conservative, who said we should not put another dollar into arms, that we should, that we were not going to get involved in this war, and we should just keep on doing what we were doing. Uh, Roosevelt himself uh, had uh, pushed to to support England after after they were isolated uh, by the events of. France early in the war, and, and of course he promoted the Lend-Lease program in which we supplied England with a lot with a lot of arms. All of these things were matters of, of considerable discussion at that time. Well, you you lived in a pretty famous state fair country. <laughs> Was that something you always looked forward to? Or? We didn't always get to go, but we always looked forward to it. Yes. This was, a, this was a big event for me to go to the State Fair in 1939, and I did not get to go every year. Uh, but uh, yes, there were lots of, uh, lots of activities uh, that surrounded the State Fair, and it was, the, it was right at the harvest season, and uh, the, the uh, boys and girls that lived out on the farm, most of them belonged to 4-H, and they raised animals to show at the State Fair. The condition of the crops by that time of year was well known, so the farmers knew if they had money to spend to go to Des Moines or not. But uh, it was uh, it was it was a big event, and we and we drew uh, we good drew good entertainment. Now was that where the movie State Fair was made? Yes, it was. Yeah. And uh, the uh, and the movie the movie has a lot of accurate things in it. I think they did a rather good job of portraying what this was all about. I took, I took my children up to the Iowa State Fair and, uh, when they were perhaps seven to ten years of age in, in that range, and, uh, and they enjoyed the rides and some of those things they could not understand why anybody would want to go in and watch those smelly pigs that they were looking at. <laughs> <laughs> well, in this <clears throat> going through high school and a year of college, had you generated an interest in some way in aviation? Well, I feel like I'd always had an interest in aviation. I always made model airplanes from the time I was small. And uh, in uh, uh, another thing that happened uh, at about the at about the uh, the same time that we've been talking about was that uh, my father decided it was time to take a trip back to visit his family in New Jersey. We uh, we did not go as a family because somebody had to stay home and take care of the business. So uh, my mother and and some of the others stayed home, and he took me and he took two of my sisters along on that trip, and we got to meet various members of the family. One of the members of the family that I met was George H. T. Miller, 
who was then head of Pratt and Whitney, and he told me that he had just they had just put an engine into production that he had worked several years to design. It was the R2800, and it was the first engine that developed uh, at least one horsepower for each pound of weight, and this made it possible to design a whole new group of aircraft uh, around this engine. And then very shortly after, there were other engines that also uh, had a high performance level. And I, uh, I, had, uh, I had shared my enjoyment of aviation things with a cousin who I, I visited in western Iowa when I was small. I was very impressed by the fact he made a model that was big enough to crawl into and you could get up in the cockpit and <laughs> pretend that you were doing great things. And in high school, in every town, we had somebody who was so enthusiastic that he had gotten involved and gone off to, to the war. The most common thing, if somebody had a little flying experience, was to go to Canada and join the Royal Canadian uh, Air Force. Uh, we had one boy in my high school whose father ran the airport, and he was allowed to solo when he was 16 years of age, you can imagine. But we thought about him, he was just about the top of the stack. I'm sure. Now, uh, your brother is older than you, yeah. and you're both looking at going into the service, I'm assuming? Uh, My brother went in service. The, the draft was established before uh, December of 1941, and <laughs> my brother uh, drew a low draft number. He was in his third year in law school when it looked like he might be drafted. So uh, he volunteered for the Naval Reserve and was, uh, was sent to Annapolis to a 90-day wonder course uh, to become an officer. And before he could get out and back to law school, uh, the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor and of course his enlistment was then made permanent for the duration of the war. Uh, uh, he, uh, he went on from this and volunteered for submarines, something that I gave him a lot of difficulty about over the years. I told him that that wasn't very smart, that he could have been, he could have been in the Air Corps where he was up in the air over all of these things and where he would have gotten to go to places like Australia and, and seen all the good looking girls and had good food and good booze. And uh, he, uh, he attempted to get back to me and, and at some point at some point in time, well, you might want to hear the, the tail end of that story, but in essence, uh, what happened was uh, he went back, he went to visit Australia only a matter of 10 or 15 years ago, and I told him about places to go visit, including Brisbane, City Hall. Brisbane is a high-rise building, and, and you go up to the top, and you can throw the shutters open and look down on a huge town square, which is a very busy place. He told me after he was there that he he went to Brisbane and he looked down on the town square and he said there were thousands of people milling around and it occurred to him there was probably somebody down there who remembered me. So he said he cupped his hands and shouted at the top of his voice, does anybody down there remember a Yank named Charlie Miller? And he said two gray-haired old ladies started waving their canes around in the air. <laughs> <laughs> That was, that was his getting even for all of my teasing that I've done. I'm assuming that uh, he had a, a career then in submarines in the Pacific? Yes, he did. He was all the way up to Tokyo Harbor. Uh, I bought a, a book which was published on the submarines in the Pacific Ocean and what they had done. It, it, uh, it analyzed everything that each submarine had done. I felt that it helped me to keep him honest when we were having discussions about who won the war. <laughs> <laughs> well, then you're then going off to the service. Um, your family, your brother's already gone. That's right. And uh, your mother and dad and the three sisters are at home. Now the sisters are, are they in the Red Cross and doing those kind of things? Or Actually, my older sister was married. Uh, during uh, my senior year in high school, and uh, uh, she was uh, 
she was married to an electrical engineer who, who uh, worked at Wright-Patterson Field in, in Ohio for a time during the war. And then he was a, a professor at Virginia Polytech. And finally, he ended up being, at least temporarily, the head of the Naval Research Laboratories in Washington and uh, was involved in, in some of the, of the technical things that the Navy developed. So you go off to the service. How do you do that? What, what, what well, gets you there? You get a little letter from the local draft board that says you have been selected. And mine said, uh, mine was mailed on the 4th of February, 1943. And it said you will appear at the Ames, Iowa City Hall on the morning of 11th of February for induction into the service. Uh, the, uh, I went down, my mother and sisters went along, and, uh, and my mother was a little teary-eyed about this because she had lost uh, brothers in World War I, and uh, she was not hopeful that she was going to be able to get through the war without losing part of her family also. But uh, I got on the bus and we proceeded to Camp Dodge, which is outside of Des Moines, Iowa. And there we spent the next several days being measured and, and examined and taking uh, written tests. Uh, we, had, we had our service shots administered. We were all in barracks, and I suppose there were probably 30 to 40 of us per barracks. And there was a, a sergeant in charge of each barracks. And in the morning they would blow the whistle and everybody would come down and fall into line. And the sergeant would stand out front in the dim light of early morning, and, and he would announce what the work details were for the day for those that were not involved in other things. And he would oftentimes ask for volunteers to do different things. One of the things, one of the things that he asked for one morning was whether we had anybody there who had experience working on swimming pools. And there were a lot of hands went up. He got a large group out of that, possibly 20. And when they returned home that night, we found out they had cleaned every latrine on the base during the day. <laughs> <laughs> so it was not a good thing to be selected out of this group. And one morning, uh, while we were in line, my name was called out all by itself. And that was really worrisome. It, uh, it troubled me that, uh, that I might have done something terribly wrong because I knew that work details were not for one person. I was told to report to a captain so-and-so. I do not recall his name now. <laughs> but that is what I did. And I went over and stood in front of his desk. And much to my surprise, he stood up, he shook my hand, and offered me a chair. And he said, how would you like a job right here at Camp Dodge, Iowa, for the duration of the war? He said, you will not have to go to basic training. You will not have to do guard duty or KP. You'll have every Sunday off. You'll have a private office and a secretary. He said, how does that sound? I said, sir, it sounds too good to be true. He said, we have a little problem here in records and assignments and we looked over your background and your records and we thought maybe you could help us. And I said, well, what am I to do? Well, he, he told me who I, was to, who I was to report to. The gentleman I reported to, uh, I, I believe, was a corporal in rank. He was in records and assignment. And he showed me to my office the captain was true to his word. My office was about five by six feet, and it had it had a desk about 18 inches deep and about five feet wide. And every morning, promptly at seven o'clock, I arrived at the office, and there was a stack of telegrams on the office on the office desk. Each one would say, "We need so many replacements." And Fort Hood, Texas, or, uh, or whatever other 
other army base that they might be talking about, and it would list what the IQ was supposed to be of the individual and his mechanical aptitude requirement, any physical requirements. Sometimes they wouldn't take colorblind people. Sometimes they wouldn't take people who were less than a certain size. But, <clears throat> but it was my job to go to the files and pull these people out. And the files were made up of cards. Uh, I, would, I would say they, these cards were probably uh, probably about 16 by 24 inches, a large manila cardboard card. And they had numbers all the way around the edge. And when you were interviewed, if you had a qualification, a little V punch was taken out where that number was all the way around. The cards were put in big files, and you'd go to the file and drop the face down, take a long welding rod, and put it through the characteristic number that you wanted. And then when you pulled the bottom out, all of the cards that filled that characteristic fell out, and you'd peel them off. So this way, you might have somebody who was a qualified mechanic who got sent to cook school and somebody who was a qualified cook got sent to mechanic school. Everybody always wondered how that happened. And this is how it happened. <laughs> and and <coughs> I, would <coughs> I would take these cards and set them aside with the telegram and uh, I'd do this for each of the telegrams on my desk. After lunch, my secretary came in. He outranked me. He was a PFC, and he took dictation, and I dictated orders to send this group of 16 to Camp Hood or that group of 21 to, to Fort Leonard Wood or whatever. And, and then uh, I, had to, I had to call for transportation for them. We had to... Uh, the transportation department had connections to the railroad usually, and if they were going very far away, we usually put them on the train. We found out what train they were going to be on. Then we found out how long they were going to be gone, so we knew how many box lunches to fix, how many meal tickets to supply, and, and, uh, and whether we needed to uh, find overnight facilities for them someplace along the line. It was all detailed. And the reason I'd been selected for this was because because my record showed that I was I was capable of performing in school, so I guess they figured I could do detail work. And and this went on for a period of time, I guess probably six or eight weeks I was doing this. The captain apparently was well satisfied. He stopped reading the orders that I dictated and just signed them. And I noticed that his golf clubs appeared in his office in there. So he apparently had improved his lot quite a bit <laughs> in the process. Well, along about this time, I, had, I indicated that I had looked into the Air Corps, and I had taken the examination, so I knew that I would eventually be transferred to the Air Corps, presumably for pilot training. A telegram appeared on my desk, transfer the following seven recruits to the nearest uh, Army Air Corps facility for basic training. Well, I knew what they wanted. They wanted me to go to a place that administered basic training in the usual manner. But I had wanted along the way to see California. I had been to the East Coast. Now my father took me to New Jersey and to the 1939 World's Fair. I wanted to go westward. So I looked for the nearest uh, the nearest base that was operated by the Western Training Command. You get all kinds of inside information when you're doing a little job like this. You know how the system works. The closest thing there was Sioux City Army Air Base, and that wasn't too far away. It wasn't so far that I would draw attention by, by assigning us there. So I assigned the seven of us to Sioux City Army Air Base for basic training. Well, I knew perfectly well they didn't get basic training at Sioux City, but I knew that they would have to get rid of us within the Western Training Command. I didn't dare tell anybody what I had done, but I wrote the orders 
went through, the captain signed them, and we were off on the Burlington Railroad for Sioux City uh, a couple of days later, and when we arrived, the colonel who was in command of the base was absolutely appalled. <laughs> he, he, had his, <laughs> he had his standing in front of his desk. He said, I don't know what idiot sent you to, to this air base for basic training. He said, we don't have the facilities for basic training. We don't know anything about basic training. But he said, there's one thing I've learned in this man's army, and that is you do as you're told. So you get basic training, and the only person I have to give it is my first sergeant. So he'll give you a couple of hours each afternoon, and the rest of the time I want you guys to stay out of trouble. And so that was my introduction to basic training. And it wasn't too long before he figured a way to get rid of us, so he sent us on then from there to, to Kernsfield, Utah, which is outside of Salt Lake City. And uh, that's, uh, that was the place that genuinely had Army Air Corps basic training. Now, Utah can get pretty cold. What was it like when you got there? <laughs> well, we were <clears throat> at Twala, which is southwest of Salt Lake City, up in the hills. And as a matter of fact, my tent was at the very end of the line on top of a high hill within view of Great Salt Lake. It, it was March and it was cold, especially at night. And it would warm up a little in the daytime. But the only heat we had, I think there were five of us in the tent, and there was a wood stove sitting in the middle of the, of the tent. Uh, if we had burned wood in it, we would have had to clean it up. So we really never got around to lighting a fire in that stove. But it was a long way from the latrine. And I can tell you that I learned very quickly that you didn't drink coffee after supper at night because to get out of your warm bed and have to go that distance to the latrine and back and get into a cold bed was just not worth it. Uh, and while we were there, while we we had additional Air Corps testing, which uh, which included the testing for college training detachments. Uh, everyone was expected to go to a college training detachment and to take courses, uh, and they had a variety of things that they might that might uh, enroll you in. But uh, the uh, the tests that were given there determined what courses you would take while you were in college training. And you might be in college training for six months would be a common length of time to be in that. Well, there were five of us that passed all of the tests, everything. They didn't have, they didn't have a plan for handling somebody that didn't qualify to take courses in the college they were sending you to. So, we sat around for two or three weeks while they decided what to do with us. And finally, they sent us to Utah State Agricultural College in Logan, Utah, in the northern part of the state. And they told us that since we didn't uh, require any of the courses that they were offering, that what they were going to do, they put the five of us in the Sigma Chi house off of campus by ourselves and told us that we should sign up for courses, uh, anything we wanted, and that the only requirement was that we meet the group for meals. We were to march to meals together with the group, and uh, we had a lot of fun while we were while we were there because uh, we were unsupervised, but we were reasonably well behaved, and we went out hiking in the mountains and, and did a lot of other things. We attended a couple of courses. And, are you all still privates? Oh yes, and we and we are uh, uh, we're we're waiting for the first group to go out because they said the first group that went out from there we would go with them, and it wasn't very long before they the group went out and we went with them then to Santa Ana Army Air Base, uh, which was where we took pre-flight. So, <clears throat> about when did you arrive in Santa Ana? It was uh, it was in the summer. 1943. And <clears throat> did you have uh, pre-flight type of training before you got into flight training? Before we, 
before we even got the pre-flight training, we had a little edu education to receive. Uh, when we got off of the train, <coughs> they put us on trucks and took us to the edge of the air base, and then we formed up in groups and we marched. We marched through the air base, down the streets, past all of these barracks, and it was apparently a, a common thing for the other groups to make fun of those coming in. So they would stand on their balconies and shout insults, you know, uh, you know, uh, you'll be sorry, and look at the head on that one, and things of this sort. Santa Ana Army Air Base had martial music piped everywhere, so every, you couldn't go to any corner of this air base and not hear the hear uh, uh, the great Sousa marches and all of this sort of thing going on. So we marched all the way through Santa Ana Army Air Base and we would stop from time to time in front of a barracks and they would call off a group of names and those were the people that were to be in that barracks. When we got to ours, while well, we went in, met the sergeant who told us that the number one rule was never to cross the threshold of his quarters because he didn't like having cadets in his quarters. Uh, we, uh, we were given all of our equipment, we made up our beds, and uh, the first big inspection occurred possibly just the day after we arrived. We stood outside and Major Gates came by, and Major Gates had a, an eye for anything that might be out of order. And he would step up and stand 18 inches in front of your face, and you were supposed to be looking straight ahead at him. He was a little low, so I had to look down sometimes. But uh, but he would uh, uh, he would ask questions and then he'd move on man by man all down the line he would check everybody we had a Chinese boy <coughs> baby faced fellow never grown a speck of fuzz on his face in his life Major Gates came up to him and looked him in the face and he said Mister did you shave this morning and the Chinese fellow had never shaved he said no sir. He said, that will be 15 demerits. That was enough to put him on guard duty for a couple of nights, plus a little bit more. <laughs> so <clears throat> every morning the Chinese guy was down at the basins with the rest of us shaving away. And, and uh, at the end of our stay, when we were getting ready to leave the, the barracks at Santa Ana, the Chinese guy stood down. He said, fellas, I want to show you something. And he opened up his shaving kit, and he took out his razor, and he undid it. He lifted the blade out. It still had the paper wrapping on it. <laughs> that was his way of getting even. <laughs> he shaved with a blade with a paper wrapping on it. Uh, if, you're, if you're interested in the other things at, at Santa Ana, I'll give you a little more. Well, you had to go through some, then your psychological testing and yes, all that? Yes, we did. We had, we had to go through psychological testing. and. And there were rumors that passed around. You uh, you learned what you were supposed to do and what you weren't supposed to do. One of them was that when the psychiatrist asked you if you masturbated, the answer was yes. Because if you said no or maybe or hesitated, then you got in for a lot more examination. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, we uh, uh, we well we did many things. Uh, but uh, among them, uh, we were put in the depressurization tank to simulate uh, 18,000 feet of altitude. And <laughs> while we were there, they explained to us that the uh, decrease in oxygen made your thinking fuzzy and your performance bad. We were each given a, a pad of, of paper and a pencil, and we were told to write things down, and at each altitude, as we increased altitude in the pressure chamber why we had more questions to answer on the pad of paper. And of course afterwards why it showed that our handwriting was barely legible, you know, by the time we got to 18,000 feet. There were always a few fellows who passed out. And if you couldn't stand 18,000 feet for a few minutes without passing out, 
uh, you were washed out of the program. Most of these guys were cigarette smokers, we noted. Uh, but uh, some of them, we lost some, some what looked to be very outstanding prospects uh, in this. And then when everything was done, all the tests were done, we were called in uh, for the evaluation. Oh, incidentally, there were, there were uh, uh, coordination tests. They had a machine with a disc that went around like a phonograph record, and it had a dot on it that moved in and out of the disc while the disc was rotating. We had two cranks and a little indicator, a pencil or indicator, and our job was to keep that pencil over the dot while the record went around and the dot went in and out. This was a this was a, a pretty difficult thing, and there weren't very many people thought they did very well on that particular one. Uh, uh, and we uh, and we also uh, uh, rode the Baroni chair, which you may remember was the, the chair where they spin you around and. Uh, and then uh, when they take the blindfold off by, you're supposed to get up and try and walk, and you walk around in big circles when, uh, when you do this sort of thing, of course. <clears throat> but uh, finally, when all the tests were completed, why we were called in, and, and uh, the gentleman who was, who was uh, talking to me, uh, first of all, congratulated me on doing extremely well in the mathematical section of the test. And he said, it's, uh, we have some difficulty in getting good enough people in mathematics for, uh, for our navigator program. And while you qualify for everything, he said, we think that uh, you ought to be a navigator because this would, uh, uh, this would fill our needs the, uh, the best. And I, I had been very careful not to speak out or criticize or do anything up to that point, but that was a little too much. And I said, sir, I said, I would not have quit college to come into the Army Air Corps to become a navigator. I said, I quit to become a pilot. And he said, you really feel that strongly about it? And I said, yes. So he said, well, he looked at his papers and he went all through everything. He said, all right, I will assign you to the pilot program since you feel that strongly about it. So I barely escaped missing my opportunity to, to be a pilot at that point. I was elated, though, because I felt the last six months had been well spent. When I got to that point, I knew I was going to go into the pilot training program. At the end of our, of our tour, while we were at pre-flight, of course, why we had lots of marching and, and uh, lots of physical things. We, uh, we, we did physical conditioning. You were supposed to be able to, to do by the time you finish the program, you should be able to do 121 sit-ups and 25 push-ups and 12 pull-ups. And there was all, also some running, wind sprints and things like that involved in it. They didn't wash anybody out, I don't believe, on these things, but it sure pressed some, some fellas a great deal to get in condition to, to be able to accomplish it all. And then we played uh, we played sports. We uh, uh, we were divided up into teams, and our team would play this another team in football one day, another team in basketball another day, and and so on. We went out on some bivouacs out into the Southern California hills. That's where I was first introduced to the cactus and to and to uh, irrigation ditches. I had no idea that they grew these crops irrigating them that way. In Iowa, we waited for the rain to come. <laughs> we didn't irrigate anything. Uh, and uh, uh, when, we, uh, when we got near the end of the program, well, before we, we were all the way through, we were, we were uh, confined to base for six weeks. We couldn't go off base for any reason for six weeks. At the end of that time, we were to have a weekend free. And one of my friends, William P. D. Wilson, who was from Kansas, uh, came around and he said his cousin lived in Hollywood and that she had invited him in for the weekend and he thought it would be a lot of fun and she had asked him if he wanted to bring a friend and he wanted to know if I would come with him. 
And I said, that sounded great. And uh, I didn't have anything else to do, and I wanted to get off base, of course. Unfortunately, I developed an acute case of vomiting and diarrhea, and I couldn't go. When he came back, I learned his cousin was Ginger Rogers, and I had missed a great opportunity. She was one of my favorite, favorite movie stars, and here I missed a great opportunity to stay in her home overnight. He said that they, they went down to her, her private move, uh, motion picture uh, uh, studio in the basement of the house and watched movies right that they were there. And uh, so after. Uh, after, after that, why, one of the fellows who had worked for Metro Goldwyn Mayor uh, came around. He called a bunch of us together and he said, "If you fellows would like to have a party when we finish here, he said, I can really arrange something." But he said, "I have to have your word. You're not going to be cheap about it. You got to, got to be willing to put up some bucks for a really good party." And. Uh, we all decided, well, we would do that. We knew it was going to break us because he told us how much money was involved. It was something like 50 bucks a person, you know. Well, we were making $21 a month. So we decided we were going ahead with this. And we did. We had a bang-up party at the end of pre-flight. It was held at the Beverly Wilshire Hotel. We had Bob Crosby and his orchestra. And this guy got us all, he said he would get everybody a date all had dates with with girls that worked in the movies, uh, mostly as extras or bit parts and things like that. But we all had dates with some pretty sophisticated girls that, uh, that put on. And I have a photo, uh, I have a photo that was taken of the entire party. It was a dinner dance affair, and the, the picture was taken from up on the stage of the entire ballroom at the Beverly Wilshire Hotel with all of us there with our dates and everything. Now, were you in uniform? Oh, was, yes. So you are private. You had, you had no other choice. A private's uniform was okay at that time. I'm just saying, though, but, but that's, that's what it was. It was a room full of privates. It was a room full of privates, that's right. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> so uh, so then I learned that uh, they, they posted who was going to, to what place for for primary flight training, and uh, Santa Ana fed a group of, I would say it was probably eight or nine small flight schools. Mine, uh, mine was at Blythe, and it was a, uh, it was a, it was a private flight school, a civilian flight school that was contracted by the Army Air Corps. And it was owned by Roger Pryor, who was also movie fame in those days. Uh, and when we got there, we went out, uh, we went by truck going out there. I never quite figured that out because it seemed to me the train would have been more appropriate. But that was the longest truck ride in the back end of the truck. I can't and imagine from Santa Ana to Blythe in a truck. Ah, uh, it was. It in was 43. Long, in 43, and, <laughs> and the roads weren't all that good, you know. Uh, but uh, but the, uh, the flight school, the Morton Air Academy, was up on top of a, uh, uh, of a bluff overlooking uh, the agricultural area around Blythe. It was a very, very nice place, really. Uh, the, uh, they had nice barracks, they had, a nice, uh, they had a nice dining facility, they had big hangars for the for the aircraft, uh, and we were assigned assigned rooms, and we were assigned flight instructors. Uh, and uh, uh, my flight instructor was a man by the name of Mr. Garrett, and Mr. Garrett had instructed at that air academy for some time, and he was a very pleasant guy. He was used to used to trying to please his clients, where uh, where the Army Air Corps in general didn't really care. 30 seconds. All right, and so uh, we had uh, uh, we had the PT-17, uh, PT-13, PT-17 Stearmans, and that was what we were going to fly at Blythe. Um, 
So now you're finally going to fly. That's right. And and this this was exciting stuff. Of course, the the way in which you learn to fly in a Stearman, an open cockpit Stearman, is a little bit different from anything that anybody would recognize today. Uh, first of all, the instructor sat in the forward uh, forward cockpit, and uh, and you sat in the back, and you had a. Could you want to point that out in the picture over here? Yes, uh, right here. And <clears throat> you had a helmet on uh, with little tubes that came out from it. They're called Gosports. And, <clears throat> and the tubing then would run up, and the instructor would have, uh, would have a, a little funnel, and he would put it up to his mouth, and he would sound a little bit like this when he's trying to tell you over the roar of the engine what to do. There were no radios in these things, and the only way you could communicate was to wave your arms around in the air. But uh, the, uh, uh, the, the steerman, first of all, when you went out to fly it, well, you had to, uh, it had an impulse starter, and you put a crank in up front, and you'd wind the crank up for a considerable period of time until you got a lot of speed up. And then you'd pull on the little cord on it, and it'd spin the prop around about twice, and and hopefully it would fire and take off. So, at any rate, the steerman, uh, uh, the steerman uh, uh, was the first airplane that uh, that I flew any significant amount in. I think I may have had uh, two hours in a Piper Cub before uh, before I actually went to primary flight training. But uh, Mr. Garrett explained things very clearly, how things worked and what you were supposed to do, and and, uh, and I didn't have any particular trouble getting the hang of, of uh, landing, landing the serum and taking it off and landing it. So uh, it wasn't too long before he came around one day and said that I was ready to solo. Well, he scared me to death, the idea of trying to fly that thing without him being up there, and, the, uh, and it was a little bit much. But when, uh, when I went to take the thing off solo, I, I found that it made the airplane light, and it leaped off the ground easily, and came around, floated a little bit on landing, but that was, a, that was about it. And I really enjoyed it a great deal, so I was having a good time doing this. Uh, we did, we, we did some attempts at minor acrobatics, uh, but the steerman was not very good for this sort of thing. It simply didn't have enough power. But we would do some spins, and we did a, we did stalls, and, and uh, when we uh, when we tried to do rolls, why we'd have to get up high and take a big dive in order to have enough speed to to complete something of that sort. Uh, while we were there, the fellows, one by one, they all soloed, and uh, and uh, we were uh, getting along pretty well. There was one fellow in the outfit that seemed to be having a little extra trouble. Uh, you may not know about Dilbert, but uh, uh, Dilbert was a cartoon character that was used by the service uh, to produce cartoons and, and uh, uh, make points with the uh, with people about how they should behave. For example, uh, they used to have a, a saying that loose, li loose lips sink ships, and they would always have Dilbert being the one in the cartoon uh, getting into difficulty. Well, we thought we had Dilbert assigned to our outfit because, uh, because uh, 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 Dilbert was having a little bit of difficulty in flying. He was given some extra attention, and it looked like he had things made all right. So they took him out to, to have him solo. Now the, the landing area uh, was a square of blacktop, about 1,800 feet each way. But we always went in the same direction on it, and uh, it was sort of a, a north-south thing where we took off and landed. And uh, Gilbert went out, and he, he took off. When he came around, he made the pattern a little bit too small, so that uh, when he cut the engine and tried to glide down for a landing, why, uh, 
he was landing much too far down the, the landing area. So he gave it the gun and he went around. And he tried it again. And this time, the pattern was still too small, but he pushed the nose down, so he was going a little bit too fast when he came across. And he gave it the gun and he came around and and he was really being shaken pretty badly about this point. He was having having real difficulty. And we had no radios in the airplane, we had no way to speak to him. He had to work the problem out himself. But finally, he came around and he decided he was gonna put that thing on the ground. And he pushed the nose down and he he uh, got it down and he pushed his stick forward and he got the wheels on the ground. Tail was high in the air and he was racing across the, uh, the black top. He had failed to get the engine all the way off, so it was helping him, uh, helping him maintain speed as he went across. Well, he got to the end of the black top and he just went busting out into the desert in a big cloud of dust and everything. And when the dust cleared, there was the airplane lying upside down. <coughs> It was lying on its high wing and, and the tip of the tail. And that left, that left him, I guess, two or three feet in the air, uh, hanging by the seat belt. And in his excitement, he reached up, unlatched the seat belt, fell out, and busted his head on a rock. And that was the end of his flying career, I'm afraid. I, really, I don't know what his real name was, but I know that he was, uh, he was sort of a warning to us about all the things that we should not do when we were, uh, when we were up there making patterns. Probably the, uh, well, there were, there were several big events probably while we were there, but probably the biggest event that we had was totally unplanned. That was, that was the time that the, that the winds shifted. The Coachella Valley, which lies to the east of Blythe, uh, pumps air from the Pacific in during the daytime. The, the heat causes the air to rise and it draws air, uh, air in through the pass. And then uh, as the day goes on, the clouds cover the sun or, or the day gets late, it cools and the air goes back out. Sometimes these things don't work exactly right. You get sudden shifts in wind and get gusting and changes of direction. One day when practically all of the newly soloed cadets were out in their steerments, this happened. The wind became fairly severe and from the wrong direction. In fact, it came in over the hangars and across the field. So that to land properly, you needed to land toward the hangars. Unfortunately, the steerman is a very unstable aircraft laterally so that if the, if the tail comes down, you only have 10 degrees to the right or left to, to maintain control. When it gets past 10 degrees, it will probably go complete a turn all by itself on the ground without any additional help from you and in spite of anything you can do. This is called a ground loop. Well, on this particular occasion, the wind had suddenly shifted. Nobody had ever practiced doing landings, flying in toward the hangar on this thing. But the wind was quite stiff, and there was no other way you could bring that sermon down except into the wind under the circumstances. So the first fellow that came back to the field saw that the wind he had been changed, uh, went out, made a pattern, and he had it figured out pretty well, and he came in the proper direction. Got his wheels on the ground, and when the tail dropped, a little gust caught him, turned the airplane more than the 10 degrees, and around he went in decreasing concentric circles until he had dragged the wing on the ground, and they had to rush out and drag the airplane off of, uh, off of the tarmac. Well, the next one came in, didn't even do that good a job, and he, he ground looped. All the instructors were standing out at the edge, horrified at first, and then they were then it became a matter of a little levity that this was going on. And they started putting quarters down on a railroad tie there, betting on each 
airplane as it appeared, whether it was going to ground loop or not. At the end of 21 minutes, we had had 28 ground loops. And, and we thought this was probably a record for ground looping even the steerman. But they couldn't very well discipline anybody for ground looping an airplane under those circumstances. Uh, when we completed our primary flight training, <laughs> again, we received assignments for uh, for moving onward. Uh, it was getting close to Christmas time. Uh, I found out that I would be going to Bakersfield, the Minter Field. Uh, the, uh, I got a, a letter about this time from my brother, uh, who was in submarine training. He was with a crew training for a new submarine in Connecticut. He told me that he had met the most wonderful girl in the world and he was getting married. <laughs> and this was kind of a blow to, to, to lose my brother, the, uh, the, the, my, my principal male connection in the family, and he was going to be having a wife very shortly. Uh, at any rate, I found out my mother was going to be going to Connecticut for his wedding, and my uncle who was with Pratt & Whitney would be part of this also. So the wedding was carried out, we completed their primary flight training, got on the train, it was an evening train. It was going to be overnight uh, to Bakersfield. And the principal thing I remember about the train ride is everyone was celebrating. They all had some booze, but nobody had as much booze as Danny Metaxas. Uh, Danny was from a, from a family that, uh, that sold fine wines and things of this sort out of San Francisco. And he was Greek and he was very volatile. And he put on a show on the on the train on the way to Bakersfield that kept most of us up all night watching. But when we got to Bakersfield, all of the levity disappeared because this was an all army base and they were all business and we got into line in a hurry. So, I guess yes. <clears throat> so roughly how many hours did you have in the steerman when you went off to uh, Bakersfield? I believe probably about 40 hours, and most of it was uneventful. However, I did fail to mention that that uh, we had a little burst of, of cold weather, and uh, I went on a cross country in that open cockpit airplane without enough clothes on, and they had me in the dispensary that night with a mild case of pleurisy, but it cleared overnight, and I was right back on flying duty. But, uh, that was the only casualty of my primary flight training was a case of pleurisy. So now you're at Bakersfield. Now we're at Bakersfield. And what type of airplanes are there? Well, we had we had the BT-13. It was also called the Balti Vibrator. Uh, it was a variable pitch propeller, fixed gear, uh, had tandem fore and aft seating and a radial engine. And it was much more capable. We did... Uh, we had 450 horsepower uh, engine in that aircraft, and we were able to do a wide variety of aerobatics. We did a lot of that. We were introduced to formation flying, all kinds of formation flying, including formation takeoffs and landings. And uh, we were introduced to uh, we were introduced to uh, uh, instrument flying. And we had some bad weather at Bakersfield, so the link trainers were kept very busy during bad weather. And we'd get into those boxes and, and uh, fly for an hour at a time and get out and find out where we, had, where we had really gone. Where we thought we had gone was not always where we went. Uh, night flying, the introduction to night flying was something that was especially unusual. Uh, we went out to a a dirt airstrip that was way away from any city lights at all. They, intentionally, they wanted it to be very black, apparently. And the strip was not outfitted with electric lamps. They put they put a bunch of uh, kerosene lamps along the side of it. Uh, they were the the globe shaped. You may remember these from years ago. A year a globe shaped. Uh, device with a big wick that came out of the top of it and the 
the highway crews used to use those out on the highway to mark mark bad spots before they had electric uh, lights that they could put out for warning. But they had those along the side of the runway in this very pitch black night and, and we would do our night takeoffs and landings and so on and that and it was, uh, I, I loved it, I thought it was really fascinating. And did you have such a thing as a landing light on those airplanes? A switch that you could turn on to? Uh, I think we had a landing light, but I think we were instructed not to use it much of the time. Now, uh, the vi vibrator had, some of them had electric props? Can you? No, this was a, a this was a hydraulic type. Prop. You had the hydraulic? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've heard stories about the electric props on them. I had electric props later on on some aircraft that uh, we had problems with, but we had, uh, we had a, a hydraulic type prop on ours. So how long would this training have lasted at Bakersfield? Most of these, uh, most of these sessions lasted three to four months in, in each. In other words, I think that we were at, I think we were at Blythe for about three months. At Bakersfield, we may have been there four uh, before we went on to advanced flight training. I had a, uh, I had a, uh, a roommate followed by the name of, of Bert Miller, who was a Mormon and. And wonderful fellow, and uh, I enjoyed having him for a roommate. I remember he had a radio, and the most popular song at that time was Mare's Eat Oats and Doe's Eat Oats, and I listened to that thing over and over again. <laughs> but uh, unfortunately, uh, Bert was killed in a, in a C-47 crash in New Guinea. He crashed into a mountain down there and, uh, and was killed. But uh, the... Uh, uh, in uh, in Bakersfield, uh, it was a little bit intense. We had well, we had lots of sports activities and lots of physical training. We were endlessly at these things, and uh, and they kept records on on everybody how far you had gone. At each of the bases, and I don't know that I mentioned this uh, earlier, but from pre-flight on. We had aircraft identification, and aircraft identification in Southern California uh, in the in the summertime was a pretty hot experience. We'd uh, we'd get in. That was when I was in pre-flight. It was that that way. But you'd go into these darkened buildings, and you'd sit around, and and you had a you had a, a little recording piece of paper and pencil to record on, they'd flash the shadow of an aircraft up up on the wall, and it would be there for like, I think, it seems to me it was like three seconds or four seconds, and then you would, you would identify, you'd pick out what it was, and they kept getting more difficult as you went along, and we, we, we were to learn the military aircraft of all of the various combatants of World War II, not just, not just the United States aircraft. Matter of fact, we always used to joke that if a fly had come into the room that most of us would have elected to shoot him down. <laughs> <laughs> but <coughs> we, we uh, uh, had aircraft identification uh, there at Bakersfield also. We did Morse code. You always had Morse code training, and you had to keep your skills up. Uh, we, uh, I remember, I remember uh, that we had to have like 15 words a minute to pass the course early on, and then we went up from that. But the requirement, the requirement was more for accuracy than it was getting a lot faster than that. I believe. I think that I think there were some that uh, that possibly got up to maybe twice that speed uh, eventually, but not everybody did. But we learned Morse code pretty well. And then we also had, uh, well, you had to learn, uh, you had to learn rules of flying. And when we got to, when we, when we got in actually flying airplanes, why we had, uh, we had courses which familiarized you with the airplane. You had, 
you had uh, cutaway pictures of the engines and the carburetors and the, all of the various functional parts. Uh, it showed you how the brakes worked and where the control cables went. <laughs> and you learned how the, how the airplane was built. And it, there's no question it improved uh, your feeling about it. You, had, you were much more secure about the airplane mm -hmm. once you knew how it was put together and how it really worked. And, uh, and I was interested in that kind of thing anyway. So Did you I, uh, have navigation gear by in any, you know, like a little radio range? Or? Oh, navigation, we started, we started out with the E6B computer. Uh, and as a matter of fact, my E6B computer is at, is at home in my, my navigation kit. But you learn to, to put a dot on the little glass, ground glass face dot for the uh, for the wind a dot for your airspeed and then you rotated it for the direction and then it told you how fast you were going to go and how far you were going to drift and uh, the, uh, the the e6b was part of it uh, we had map reading of course along with that uh, we uh, we learned about the various projections of, uh, that were used in map making and, uh, and what things you had to watch for on some projections, why one inch does not always equal 50 miles, it's, uh, it changes on, on different ones. And, and then on the night flying, when we got into that, why we learned about the red and green airways, because at that time in the United States, the airways were all identified by blinking lights and whether the blinking lights were red or green and then how many times they would they would blink an identification so if it blinked uh, say a dash and three dots in red that identified a particular airway uh, position in, in your area and we use those red and green airways uh, right on through until the early 1950s when they were finally decommissioned. Uh, we also learned about the, uh, the, uh, the old A&N navigation system that we used for approaches uh, at that time. And, and we, had, uh, we had the published charts that showed how you were supposed to, how you were supposed to utilize the chart to find the airstrip that you're looking for, if the weather is bad, if there's if there's uh, fog or limited visibility, and so on. Well, over there in Bakersfield, you could have some fog. Yes, there was a lot of it there, and uh, uh, but all in all, it was good. We we did tire of being on the base, and when we could, uh, when we got, when we did get free, why well, we'd go in frequently, just to go in and play pool or uh, or swim at the YMCA, and if we really got tired of it, we'd get four or five guys together and rent a hotel room <laughs> and stay overnight over the, on the weekend. Uh, we didn't really have very much of a social life there. They, uh, they, uh, they, didn't, uh, they didn't have much in, in the way of dances for servicemen and things of that sort. Well, somewhere along the line, you guys are going to get selected for different types of flying. You're going to go to fighter, you're going to go to transports, you're going to go to whatever. Um, how are they going to sort you out to do this? Because your training, you know, it's coming to an end there. That's right. And so, how does that happen? Well, in my case, uh, Mr. Garrett, who was my primary instructor, talked to me quite a bit about the future, and he told me that he thought I had a future in aviation. And he said the one thing you don't want to do is to sign up to be a fighter pilot, because he said you're going to miss out on the things that will be most valuable to your career down the line. And he said, I'm going to, that he, Mr. Garrett, would, would put into my record that he thought that I ought to be assigned to transports. And he said, that way you'll get the, the uh, kind of training and experience that the airlines are looking for, and, and you can look forward to possibly flying for airlines when you get out of, out of service. I really questioned that a civilian had, uh, had any authority or carried any weight on things like that. But as time went on, it appeared that, uh, that 
they were looking at what he had to say and carrying it out to the T. And when I uh, left Bakersfield, I went to Pecos, Texas to multi-engine school. Uh, we, we took the train, took the train to Pecos, and uh, I remember going by way of Carlsbad, uh, New Mexico, when we were on our way there. When we got to Pecos, we thought it was a pretty forsaken looking place, and it was. <laughs> We, they had uh, uh, supplying multi-engine trainers. Apparently, was a bit of a of a problem for uh, for the uh, Air Corps at that time, and <coughs> different ones were used at different bases. We had uh, uh, we had the uh, Cessna Bobcat, the UC-78 aircraft, and it had a Jacobs it had two Jacobs engines. And it was supposed to have variable pitch propellers on these, but there weren't enough variable pitch propellers to go around. So we got wooden propellers and we had phony controls uh, up in the cockpit, which we were to activate, actuate just as though we really had a variable pitch propeller. <laughs> they had retractable gear, of course, on the, on the UC-78. And <clears throat> it was a, it was also referred to uh, as the bamboo bomber because it was a wooden structure covered with canvas. There aren't very many of those left over because most of them uh, were either devoured by termites or rotted away over the years. Uh, and uh, I have rarely seen a UC-78 in, uh, in recent years in anybody's museum. But uh, the UC-78 had quite a bit of room in the cabin. Uh, there were two seats up front, and the left one was usually occupied by the student who was flying, the right one by the instructor, and then there was a bench seat behind that took three persons. Uh, I found the uh, UC-78 a little awkward uh, to land because it had a bad float characteristic, and in the Texas winds, why well, it was hard to keep them on the ground. Sometimes when you thought you had them down, and and completely corralled, they would take off in that <laughs> again when a gust of wind came by. But uh, eventually, why well, we managed, uh, we managed it all right. And uh, we had uh, we had a lot of instrument training in that aircraft. Uh, in those days, in order to obstruct view, they put red celluloid liners in in uh, behind the windows of the airplane. And you could see through the red celluloid, although it wasn't, visibility wasn't everything I think it probably should have been. And then uh, they would give the, the person who was doing the instrument flying a set of green goggles to wear. And this made all of the windows look absolutely black, but you could still read the instruments through the green goggles. And this combination plus the the heat of that West Texas area during the daytime, uh, just about enough to do in a lot of the fellows when they were up there. But we would go up <coughs> for perhaps two or three hours at a time, and uh, and each of the four students then would take take his turn flying the uh, flying the uh, uh, the aircraft on instruments, and in fact. Uh, uh, even for some of the other work, why we might have uh, uh, have other other cadets sitting in the back end of the airplane. Uh, had a little experience when I was down there that I was not very happy about, but resolved, and that is that uh, I was assigned a, a Lieutenant Love as as an instructor. And on our first meeting, he told the four of us uh, not not to get too excited about finishing because uh, he didn't like the looks of us too well and he he wasn't sure that any of us were going to make it and we found out from some other sources that he was trying to do things to get himself relieved of instructional duties so he would be assigned to a, to a combat unit instead and sure enough uh, he gave us very little in the way of instruction and, and uh, and put all four of us up to be washed out at the same time. So, I, uh, having 
because it was perfectly clear what was going on, I did something that was probably against regulations in many ways, but I contacted the commanding officer of the outfit and asked for an audience with him. He gave it to me and I explained to him what was going on. He said that he would like to look into it and uh, he scheduled each of the four of us for a check ride with him and decided that we were perfectly adequate, that we had not been well instructed, but we were perfectly adequate, uh, changed instructors and, uh, and uh, fired Lieutenant Love, which had been his, uh, his desire anyway. <clears throat> and because it had put us back about two weeks on the thing, he had another class that was finishing only four weeks after the one that we were in. So he asked us to, to go into the next class and finish up with them instead, which we did. Uh, after, uh, uh, after this, and we were, uh, uh, we had the usual uh, uh, amounts of ground school. We had Morse code and aircraft identification, and uh, we had instruction in the in the components and and uh, and the nature of, of the aircraft that we were flying, the UC-78. We had uh, a lot of uh, of instruction in in military rules as they applied to aviation while we were down there, uh, as well as the civil, civil aircraft code rules. Uh, we, we planned our own cross countries and flew them both day and night uh, in, the, uh, in the UC-78. And uh, we, had, we, had a certain, we had a certain amount of solo time in it, even though it was, it was an airplane that was not necessarily meant for solo activities, why they, they had, us, had us fly solo a certain amount of time. At night time we'd fly out over the West Texas prairie and we would see the gas burning off of oil wells off in the distance. They were frequently the best navigation points that we had. Uh, we, uh, when we completed, uh, oh yes, and, and the, the physical activities continued just the same. In fact, it was really big there at, uh, at advanced flight training while we made up uh, we made up teams out of the group. And I had seen how they did this before in the group. Uh, I think there were I think there were like seven, six or seven teams. So they lined everybody up and every seventh man went into one team. Well, I saw, I saw an opportunity for us to, to have a, an outstanding sports career at this place. Uh, one of the fellows that uh, I befriended was Charlie Black, who was an uh, All-American basketball player from Kansas University. <coughs> and we had a couple of other fellows that were very good athletes, too. So I asked him if they wanted to all be on one team. <laughs> and they said yes. So I told them how you do it. I said, we'll line up, you see to it, you get in line every seventh position all the way down. We all ended up on one team and we took the base by storm in athletics. Nobody ever figured out how we all ended up on that <laughs> same team. <laughs> but we, 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 won, we won in basketball, we won in football, we won in baseball, the whole works. Uh, so uh, at any rate, uh, at the uh, at the end of this time, why uh, we had graduation, there were 500 of us. It was the they were graduating 500 classes of 500 at Pecos when I left there. It was the they were the biggest classes that they had in the Army Air Corps in World War II. And uh, at the time of graduation, uh, there were 490 assignments given out along with a leave. We had two weeks leave. And they were given assignments where they would go to to transition into a, a regular operational military airplane. There were ten of us who were sent on two weeks leave and told we would get our orders when we returned. Uh, I went, uh, went home to Iowa. It's the first time I had been there uh, in most of a year and a half. And uh, 
ran in by one of my best buddies who had gone into the Navy Air Corps. He and I had gone on down to sign up when I found out the Navy didn't want my ear. Uh, and uh, he, he had been slow getting in. They hadn't called him up very soon. So I was finished and he was just getting started. But he, he was uh, free for a weekend and was home while I was there. And we did a few things together, had some good times. Went back to find out that <coughs> the ten of us uh, had orders direct to the South Pacific without transition into another aircraft and we were most surprised. We tried to figure out whether it was because uh, because we were particularly good or particularly bad that we had been put into this group. But in any case it didn't it didn't sound like we had won any lottery when we were assigned directly that way. Now uh, if you want to know how we moved from there, why we uh, we were uh, we uh, we were given uh, vouchers so that we could fly part of the way on the airlines, or we could go part of the way on train or or by bus. Uh, I chose to hitchhike part of the way, and then and then I caught a continental airliner, uh, which uh, flew me up to San Francisco, and uh, I went out and, uh, and reported, uh, reported uh, out there at the debarkation uh, area, which is up north of San Francisco. Uh, we had a few days, but not too much to do, so I spent time in San Francisco looking around. In fact, one night, one of the things that I that I discovered immediately was that our that our our cotton outfits that we were wearing down in Texas were not adequate for San Francisco evenings. It got cool up there at nighttime, even though it was summertime uh, in San Francisco. So uh, at the end of the day, I'd head back uh, back up to uh, Camp Stoneman and and get out uh, a wool outfit. In fact, I kind of kind of liked the dressiness of the of the officer's outfit that I had just received anyway. I thought that looked pretty good with the wool bars on the shoulders and, and, uh, and so on. And one night I had a date and I was all decked out in my officer's uniform and, uh, and I thought I would impress her. I took her to the top of the mark up on the top of Knob Hill at a marvelous cocktail lounge where you could look over a lot of San Francisco up there. And we went up and ordered a drink, finished it, and I was just ordering a second one when a gentleman came around and looked at me and, and looked at my date and he said, uh, I'm sorry but I need to see identification for you too. She passed but I didn't. <laughs> so in spite of being a commissioned officer, I was summarily ejected from the top of the park. <laughs> And we went down to the St. Francis Hotel down the street. They treated us much better down there. <laughs> but but uh, <clears throat> some, uh, some days later, why, uh, they told us that we would be leaving the following morning from Hamilton Field. And we went out, and there were about, probably about 30, maybe 35, I don't think more than 40 of us, got on the C-54 bound for Hawaii. That was a formidable trip in those days. A nice four-engine DC-4, and it was the best thing available, but it was a 12-hour trip to Honolulu. And uh, as a matter of fact, the reason we didn't have more people on board was we had to have that extra fuel uh, for, the, uh, for the trip. So, to pass the time on the way over, we played blackjack much of the way, and, and I really had, uh, I, I won pretty well on the way over, and I thought, this is kind of silly, if I, uh, if I keep doing this, I'll probably end up losing some point in time down there. <laughs> and well, and when we, uh, when we got to Honolulu, uh, I went in, I was eating in the officer's mess, 
and they had a slot machine at the door. When I came out, I had a quarter left over. A quarter would look pretty big to me because when I grew up in the Depression, I didn't see very many of those. But I put it, put it in the slot machine and I hit the jackpot with one, with one quarter. And then I knew it was time to quit gambling because I knew I was never going to get ahead of that. <laughs> but while I was in Honolulu, we were there for about a week, I guess, <laughs> went in, went to Waikiki several times, saw the Royal Hawaiian Hotel, which I had heard a lot about, and it looked like a beautiful, big hotel to me. It was only years later when I went back and saw the high-rises and other hotels that they had put on on the beach around the Royal Hawaiian that I realized how small it really was. Uh, but uh, I did that, I visited the Dole Pineapple uh, plant. They had some, they had some uh, water fountains, water coolers uh, that were uh, filled with pineapple juice <laughs> instead of water. We thought that was pretty clever. And, uh, and I went down to Pearl Harbor to see what that looked like. And in the words of many people, it was a mess all right. I saw the ships sitting down in the sunken in the water, some of them sticking out. I uh, uh, went over to check on my brother's submarine, the USS Scabbard Fish, and uh, found out that the Scabbard Fish had just left port about three or four days earlier, and uh, they were off on a Pacific cruise, so I didn't get to see my brother at that time. But then they found a C-54 for us, and we took off for Johnson Island, where we refueled and uh, took off once again and landed in Port Moresby. The, uh, when I got to Port Moresby, I found that I'd been assigned to the 21st Troop Carrier Squadron in Brisbane, Australia, and uh, that uh, it might be a few days before I would get transportation down to Brisbane to join them. And <clears throat> we, we pitched tents uh, out in the grass outside of, of Jackson Strip, uh, just out of Port Moresby. They had about seven, seven strips, I believe it was, five or seven strips at Port Moresby. But Jackson was the one that we used most anyway. And, <clears throat> and after I had checked in there, I watched the C-54s come in. They had some others came in. The very next one in had two people that I recognized from Ames, Iowa. One of them was the son of the city manager. His name was John Ames. And <clears throat> he was, a, uh, he was a, I believe, an infantry officer. And I spoke to him for a little bit. And then the next fellow off was a guy by the name of Bill Chambers. Bill had come to Ames to go to Iowa State College without any money in his pocket. My father had given him a job and housing, and I worked with Bill Chambers on Saturday mornings uh, on a pretty regular basis over a period of nearly two years. And, uh, well, he was delighted to see me, and it turned out that he was a navigator. And, uh, and I found out that navigators were really very rare down there. And he said, you know, if I can get transferred your outfit I'd like to so that we could be together. So I said, fine. And he did. He was transferred. And that's the reason the 21st had a navigator, while a lot of other outfits didn't have any. So you're you're in the 21st now? I'm, I'm in the 21st, but I haven't actually seen my people, because they're in Brisbane, Australia, and I'm still sitting at Port Moresby. Now, where did the 21st form? 21st uh, formed uh, at... Uh, it was formed in Australia, uh, and some of the people, some of the people got together uh, out in Western Australia. But actually, uh, it was formed at Amberley Field, which was in the Brisbane area. It was officially formed there, and it was originally put together as the 21st Transport Squadron. They didn't have a designation of troop carrier as such at that time. But within a few months they did, and then it became the 21st Troop Carrier Squadron. It was made up mostly of people that had come down from uh, the Philippines. And uh, the, uh, 
uh, the people that came to the Philippines were not all United States Army people. There were uh, some Dutch citizens too. The Dutch East Indies Airways had been flying in the area. And those people uh, arrived with their, uh, with their DC-2 aircraft. This, uh, uh, this may be something you'd like to, uh, like to show here. The, uh, uh, a little later on, uh, along the way, why I, an artist in Townsville put this, this patch together for the 21st Troop Carrier Squadron. And uh, he, uh, he painted them. My original patch is on leather, as are the other ones, and they were hand-painted uh, by, uh, by this same artist. His name was Blunt, and, uh, and uh, he, had a, uh, he had a nice looking daughter about 16 or 17 years of age, and I had the privilege of escorting out a few times also. After I went over to buy my patch, why, I, I got a side bargain from the thing. I got a girlfriend out of it too. Uh, but uh, we were in the 5th Air Force at that time, and, uh, and uh, then later, uh, along the way, they reorganized things and they made us part of the Far East Air Forces, which had this, this other patch that was on the same sheet of paper. Uh, at any rate, uh, uh, an, an airplane from the, from the 21st Squadron came into Port Moresby and uh, they contacted those of us who had been assigned to the 21st Squadron and said that the squadron was going to be moving to NADZAP up in New Guinea. And if you'd like to get a picture of the areas that we're, that we're talking about, uh, to give you an overall view, this one may be the, the best right here. The uh, Australia being down here, and the northern part, Brisbane, is here, is where my squadron was located. Sydney, below that. Townsville and Keynes are up here near the tip. <coughs> I landed at Port Moresby, New Guinea, which is out on the tip, and it was the only portion of New Guinea not occupied by the Japanese at that time. And then Nadzab, where they were moving the 21st up to Nadzab, which was in the Markham Valley. And that is up just a short distance uh, above this. Nadzab is up in this territory right, right here. And I found this to be a rather barren place. We didn't have fresh food when we were in these areas, and, and I had problems with that early on. I lost from 165 to 145 pounds uh, during the early time that I was in, in New Guinea. But we had flying and a lot of it because the outfit was badly undermanned Douglas MacArthur had found that he was able to bypass big Japanese bases and, <clears throat> and, and by bypassing them he meant establishing an airstrip on the other side with fighter aircraft uh, to keep the Japanese from resupplying these bases because these were a long way from the Japanese, uh, from the Japanese homeland also. <clears throat> So, we had, I was the 56th pilot to join the 21st Troop Carrier Squadron. Uh, the technical orders for this called for the squadron to have 113 pilots, and I think probably at one point in time or another we eventually got 113 pilots, but we didn't have them for long periods of time. The ideal number of aircraft would have been probably 25 to 27 aircraft, and we were somewhat short of that. But 
the air bases with the fighters that were bottling up large numbers of Japanese troops had to be supplied so that we carried all of the gasoline, all of the munitions, the food, everything required to maintain a fighter squadron at uh, one of these air bases. And we were out hauling these things on a daily basis. My first month in the squadron, I flew about 125 hours, and which is a large number. The second month was almost like it, and by the end of the third month, I had met all my qualifications for captain. I took the examination and became a first pilot. So my training was somewhat shortened, but uh, far from being poor training, uh, I had uh, I had uh, uh, a gentleman who oversaw my my training, who had been with United Airlines as a pilot, and had apparently had had some earlier training experience. Uh, he, uh, he was very exacting, and I appreciated the opportunity to fly with him, although I flew with anybody who needed a co-pilot uh, early on, so that I was likely to fly with any of 19 or 20 different first pilots uh, at that period of time. Early uh, in this time, uh, the, uh, the now, island, yes, excuse me. One thing we didn't discuss is what airplanes you were flying, what, All right. what yes. birds were in here. All right, well, the, the C-47, the DC-3 for the, uh, the military version, we have some nice C-46 pictures here. And I think maybe, can you, uh, can we? Somewhere in here I have a phone. Okay. Oh, while, you're, while you're getting that, why I, yeah. I'll give them a little view of a, of a C-47. The DC-3 had come into service in the United States. It was the first really high quality airliner uh, that had been developed any place in the world. And the Army version of the DC-3 was the C-47. It was the workhorse of the Army Air Corps, and we flew primarily C-47s, although we would take almost any aircraft that the, uh, that the suppliers made available to us. Uh, this, uh, this model of a, of a C-47 is, uh, is very true to form, and it, it shows approximately what we were, what we were using. Here's, here's the C-47 uh, photograph that give you another picture of it sitting on the ramp. Uh, in uh, civilian use, why they they would load these airplanes usually to about uh, 25,000 pounds maximum, maybe 26. Uh, we loaded them much heavier. In fact, we, because we knew they would carry it, well, we put much heavier loads on them. The problem was that the one engine would not sustain them uh, in flight. You would slowly lose altitude if you lost an engine when you had 29 or 30,000 pounds on the aircraft. Uh, or, or if the uh, meteorologic conditions were poor, either one. Now, <clears throat> what were some of the high points about that airplane. What do you, what do you remember about it the most? <laughs> well, <laughs> the, the first thing, the first thing I discovered about the C-47 was that I thought it was relatively easy to land. It was really very much of a pussycat. But understand, it was a, it was a tail dragger. It was not, uh, it was not a tricycle gear aircraft like some of our later aircraft. Uh, I was, uh, I was amazed that it, uh, uh, that it had an autopilot in it, that there was actually a machine that could take over some of the flying. While the autopilot wasn't terribly reliable, but they worked the larger share of the time. Uh, and uh, the crew of the, uh, of the C-47 included a uh, pilot, a co-pilot, uh, the crew chief, 
who was an aircraft mechanic and was primarily responsible for that aircraft and he always flew with it and we usually had a radio operator along too except for very short trips we carried a radio operator there were uh, uh, there were some other things that were new to me it had uh, uh, what we now call a radar transponder they called an IFF for identification friend or foe and we had to get the uh, the codes that applied for that particular day and see that they were put into the IFF each day. That was usually the radio operator's job to do that. The, uh, uh, the aircraft was a very capable aircraft. It lifted loads well, but as I say, if you lost an engine, it had trouble maintaining altitude with any substantial load. What, what engine was in that initially? That was the Pratt & Whitney R1830 engine. And it was a little bit more capable than the right engine that was used in the civilian models. And a little more reliable and a little more capable both. Did it stay with that engine through the whole time? It, it always stayed with that engine. They've tried to, they've tried to modify uh, that aircraft. Just a second, I think. Well, we were talking about uh, the uh, engines on the airplanes. And oh, I was talking about the loading of the airplane. And well, and, and, and that they had never changed from, was the 1820? That's right, 1830. 1830? Yeah. Or 1830. And, and we talked about the uh, crew, pilot, co-pilot, and, and the right, IFF. Right, okay. Now, what I thought maybe at this point, I, I I kind of think it makes the rest of the story fit if I tell a little bit of what had happened down there that put us in the position of, of going on the offensive in the in the Pacific. You want that in there? Yeah, go ahead. All right. Tell me when to start. Go right ahead. It's recording. All right. To give you a little background then. Prior to the time that I joined the squadron, the South Pacific had been sort of a poor cousin in World War II. The United States felt they had their hands full in Europe, and uh, they thought whatever was going on in the Pacific would be given to the Navy and the Marines uh, to handle until the European War was over and they could, they could better support it. General MacArthur was made commander-in-chief for the Southwest Pacific area, and, <clears throat> and he was given instructions from the Pentagon uh, that his approach to things should be to, uh, to uh, back off and put up a defensive line across Australia to hold the more populated areas. Uh, that they would not be able to support him with reinforcements for an offensive campaign of any sort. He saw his first opportunity uh, when we had nothing left of New Guinea except Port Moresby itself and the immediate surrounding areas. And, uh, and uh, the Japanese wanted to come across the mountains to take Port Moresby. The Battle of the Kokoda Trail followed this and uh, he threw everything that was available to him uh, into that, that battle in order to hold the Japanese back. It was a difficult fight, but uh, he was successful in this. And uh, at that point, the Japanese decided that they needed to reinforce uh, their people in the Buna area. And uh, they set out with uh, a naval group involving five troop transports and uh, uh, a number of destroyers and other naval ships to go down and land troops there. The Battle of Coral Sea had recently been fought and uh, while we were more or less victorious in this, we did lose some of our, our naval prowess in it also and we simply did not have vessels available to to oppose uh, these ships that were uh, coming out uh, from the Rabal area. 
General MacArthur, in consultation with his, uh, with his Air Corps generals, uh, decided the only thing that we had that might be worthwhile would be to try a skip bombing te technique that had been used experimentally but had never been tried in battle. Uh, he had a fair number of B-25 bombers, and uh, fortunately, as this flotilla approached the east coast of New Guinea, there was a low cloud cover. This prevented the Japanese Zero fighters from getting in and protecting the flotilla, and the, uh, the American B-25s took off, flew at uh, wave top level out, dropped their bombs, which skipped on the water uh, just high enough uh, to, uh, to get above the armored area of the ships. All five troop transports were sunk and also several of the other Japanese naval fighting vessels. Uh, this was referred to as the, as the Battle of Bismarck Archipelago, and uh, it suddenly put MacArthur in a position where he felt that he ought to be going on the offensive because he had the Japanese reeling from this. Because of the limitation in personnel and equipment that he had, he tried a sample run uh, up to the Admiralty Islands, uh, where he found an airstrip that had been abandoned by the Japanese. Will it help if we put that chart up and there? And yes, perhaps we could put the chart up where, where this could be seen. Just to, to uh, bring you up to date on the map here so you can see what I'm talking about. Rabaul is located right up here uh, on the on this in this area. The Admiralties that I'm talking about, the airstrip being on, is right here. Here is Port Moresby, New Guinea, and and the course of this was the Japanese group came down across here through the uh, Bismarck Sea. They were met with. B-25 bombers, which wiped them out effectively. MacArthur then took a small group to see, to test the possibility of isolating this huge base at Rabaul from its naval support. He went up, took the airstrip. We had no naval vessels to supply it, however, so he used the, uh, <coughs> he used the air transport that he had. The United States was the only country in the world that had a well-organized air transport. He found that he could fly in everything that was necessary, and as long as those fighters were there and active, the Japanese were unsuccessful in resupplying their base up at Rabaul. With that taken care of, there was a second very large base at Weewak, which is right here. And the combination of those bases accounted for over a half a million Japanese, and they represented the Japanese forces that would be sent down to Australia to invade Australia. So rather than put a defensive line across Australia, MacArthur ingeniously devised this plan to go and pick up an airstrip up here and put fighters on it, go past Weewak to Atapi in this area, put fighters on a strip there, and then very almost immediately after that go to Hollandia and do the same thing there. He was able to isolate probably a half a million Japanese troops who we never had to fight. Approximately half of these were apparently lost uh, to disease and starvation through the war, and, uh, and only about half of them came off of those island areas. As soon as this had been accomplished, then our base at NADZAB down here was used to support the already ongoing fight for the islands out here off western New Guinea. The biggest of those was Biak Island, and that became a very large base. And after a short time at Biak, as soon as, at, at, pardon me, as, only a short time at NADZAB, when Biak was secured, we were moved to Biak Island and we knew we were probably going to be there for a long while because 
this was going to be a long fight getting on from there on up to the, the Philippines. When we arrived at BIAC, uh, the, uh, we were told that there, was, there were going to be paratroop exercises at Dobadura, which is about 800 miles, I would guess, down here uh, to eastern New Guinea. And I was to be the co-pilot for a fellow by the name of Willie Williams, who was considered to be somewhat of a daredevil in the squadron. We took off to go to, to Dobadura, and along the way down, he asked me to move over to the left seat. And he took the airplane down to DC-3, C-47, down to treetop level, and simply told me to maintain my heading. And he took a Thompson submachine gun off of the wall of the airplane, opened the right-hand window, and stuck it out. And about this time, we burst out over the big base of Weewak, this big airfield, we flew, flew very close to the ground, right across the air, airfield at Weewak, while we saw people running ahead of us, getting out of the way, and he was shooting his Thompson submachine gun out of the window. I didn't really care for this daredevil activity, and when we got down to Dobadura and we had completed our activities, he came around and told me he wanted to leave early that he was in a hurry to get back. And I said, well, I didn't have my things ready. I used several excuses. Ask him if he could get somebody else to fly instead, which he did. And unfortunately, he pulled the same trick going back, ran into a, ran into a, either a telephone pole or a tree trunk, and the airplane crashed, killing everyone on board. So now I'm at Biak Island, and uh, I'm at Cerrito Strip. There were three strips on Biak Island. These were cut out of the coral. Uh, the, uh, the jungle was thick there, but the dirt was very thin, and just under it was solid coral, which was chalky soft. So they would use uh, heavy uh, caterpillar tractors to scrape out an airfield there. It was very satisfactory as an airfield, but when it rained, which was every afternoon, the dust from the airfield would become a little light white mud that you'd get on your shoes and track into everything. Uh, we flew to all different bases all, all around. We came, uh, we came over most of the way to Borneo, and uh, we serviced bases on back, went back to Australia on frequent occasions. and. <clears throat> And I very rapidly, uh, under, under the uh, influence of, of uh, a fellow by the name of Cominus, who had flown for United Airlines, uh, achieved my captain status and was ready to fly as first pilot. My first trip out as first pilot was to Awi Island, which is only across from Biak, a short distance. I had a load of perhaps 25 personnel or so that I carried over there. When we got to the other end, landed, it was an uneventful trip. One of the passengers came up and introduced himself to me. He was a, a Dutch East Indies Airlines pilot who had flown with our squadron in the past. He was a Russian who was a naturalized Dutch citizen, and he was, he was known everywhere because at that time he was said to have the most hours of any pilot in the world, which was something over 25,000 hours huge amount in those days. But I was fascinated that my first trip out as captain, I had the pilot on board as a passenger who, who had the most hours of anyone in the world. Uh, we had a, a group of us that decided that since we were probably going to be on Biak Island for an extended period of time, we wanted to do better than live in the tents that we were, that we were given. Uh, and. Uh, the group of us, which I prodded along, started gathering materials to build a small house. Uh, we, uh, the, the group was composed of Dave Glasscock and Elmer Holstein, Clarence Sanders, uh, and uh, 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 and a couple, a couple of other fellows that uh, worked with us along the way. We went down to the docks and we, we would get 
wooden crates and uh, salvage the pieces out that we could use until we assembled enough materials to put together a small two-room place. We put a, we built it on stilts that were about 18 inches or two feet off the ground to keep it away from the varmints on the ground. And uh, uh, we, we found some uh, plywood, which we used for external paneling, but we left the top 30 inches uh, open and we got a couple of rolls of screen wire so that we screened it all the way around at the top 30 inches. And the roof was to have a long overhang so that the big storms wouldn't blow through, even though we didn't have any windows for that top portion. Finding the roof was a problem that almost got us into deep difficulty because in, in searching around the Biak Island, why <laughs> we found a clearing where they had had some troops at one time and they had built a, a uh, a shelter uh, for their uh, mess area. This place was sitting out there, didn't seem to be doing anything, and uh, and we thought that, uh, that the sheet, corrugated sheet metal on the roof would be just exactly what we needed. So we checked out four vehicles from the motor pool, went out and hooked to the four corners of this place, and we all drove away at the same time to bring it down to level where we could work on it. And we, we had removed the corrugated sheet metal roofing and had it in stacks and ready to come back when a colonel showed up and wanted to know what we were doing and what our authority was for doing this. Uh, he said that he thought we were way out of line and that our squadron would be getting a letter from him very promptly. Fortunately, the executive officer of our squadron, who would receive the letter, of course, was one of our group. Uh, that was Elmer Holstein. So, <laughs> Elmer sat waiting to see what the letter was going to say. Well, when it came, it said that uh, that he had observed this illegal activity and he wanted to speak to the ringleader of the group and, uh, and have some words with him. Dave Glasscock says that we ganged up on him, but we made him ringleader at that point. <laughs> and he had to go over and talk to Colonel Imperata, who was the commanding officer of the group. There were four squadrons in the group. And <clears throat> Colonel Imperato read him the riot act about all of military law, and what he was violating, and the problems that we were all in with this. And when he got all through, he said, now you know what you've done wrong. And he said, knowing that you fellows have a great deal of guts yourself, I know what you're going to do is go back out there and get that sheet metal and finish your house anyway. So go ahead and do it. <laughs> And that was that was how our house was built on Biak, and we lived in it for about ten months after we uh, after we put it up. Well, you guys must be getting pretty close to going into the Philippines. Then. Well, uh, at the end of that time, yes, uh, at, we were still on. It was during this ten month period that we did go to the Philippines. One other thing I want to mention about Biak, though, is that when we first arrived there we were told that there were still a lot of Japanese out in the woods. We had three airstrips on, on Biak, and we didn't use the name of the airstrip. We used a tower name, so it confused the Japanese even more which one we were involved in. But ours, Cerrito Strip had Tuffy Tower. That's the one that we, we reported to. We were told that there were a lot of Japanese still out in the jungle and that we had to take proper precautions against them because they could still do a lot of damage. In fact, they suggested that there might be as many as 1,500 Japanese troops out there still. And six weeks later, we got a revision of that estimate to 3,500 Japanese troops. When the war was over, 35,000 Japanese surrendered at Biak Island. They had had that many people out there during this entire time. Our cook killed two of them with his meat cleaver when he caught them trying to steal food. From, uh, from our place. Uh, they uh, they uh, got a lot more food on one occasion at any rate. They stole enough American vehicles over a period of time uh, to, uh, to form a, a whole group. And they went in the middle of the night. This whole group of, of American trucks came rolling down the road, went to the commissary broke in, stole quantities of food, disappeared back into the jungle, and we never heard from them again. So 
we know where they were getting some of their food at any rate. Uh, and, uh, and you're right, during this time, uh, we were getting ready for the Japanese invasion. The invasion fleet was at Hollandia, and this, the Hollandia was probably the closest I ever came to being shot down because I was flying on, on instruments uh, and flew over, inadvertently flew over the invasion fleet at Hollandia and without, without knowing about it, my transponder or identification friend or foe had malfunctioned and was not working. So when I broke into an open, I found uh, I found a lot of uh, flak, anti-aircraft flak around me. Got on the radio immediately <laughs> and told them who I was. Took evasive action and we got out of the place all in one piece without getting beaten up. Uh, as we were headed up toward the, the Philippines, uh, the invasion of Leyte took place simultaneously with the invasion of Peleliu Island in the Palau group. We also, there was also an island called Anguar in that group. The army was to take Anguar and the Marines, 1st Marine Division was to take Peleliu. They didn't want to go in ahead of time because they were afraid that that would tip the Japanese off that that's the direction we were coming from. So <laughs> they invaded Peleliu Island almost simultaneously with with hitting the beaches at, uh, in the Philippines. They ran into unexpected resistance and they had a lot of problems with it. We needed Peleliu Island for refueling and on the map this being Biak Island right here, uh, Peleliu Island is right here. So this was a long overwater hop up here. I'm, I'm guessing that it was probably six or seven hundred, well, five or six hundred miles anyway, up here to Peleliu. This is Leyte, where we hit the beaches in the Philippines, right here. So, <clears throat> In order to, when, they, when the Philippine invasion was able to scrape out an airstrip, we immediately began flying things in for them. We had to go from Leyte to Peleliu along in the afternoon. We would wait overnight and refuel because there were no fueling facilities or parking facilities on Leyte. We would go to Leyte and circle until the airstrip was clear and it was our turn we would land, and as we went down the runway, the crew chief would open the cargo door. We would turn the airplane around, kick all the cargo out on the tarmac, and take off in the opposite direction to make room for the next airplane to come in. We would then return to Peleliu to refuel before we went back to, to Biak Island. <clears throat> in the course of going to Peleliu one evening, it was along toward dark. We had tied the airplane down for the night, and the fighting was going on in Peleliu. When it was dark, you could lie under the wing of our airplane and watch the tracer bullets fly across from the ridge uh, up above the, uh, the airstrip. And we had to guard our airplanes because the Japanese would get on a piece of wood and they'd float around the side of the island, get behind us, and try and come in and, and put hand grenades on the tails of the airplanes. The uh, one evening, uh, it was dark, it got dark uh, near six o'clock uh, in this equatorial area all year round. The darkness came about uh, six o'clock or a little after. And uh, a jeep pulled up and the driver uh, asked me if I was in command of the airplane and I said, yes, that was right. He said, well, the commander of one of the naval units up there would like to extend a, uh, an invitation to me to have cocktails with him. Well, the idea of having cocktails out in the field was pretty great, even if you had to sit, sit in a mud hole, it would have been great. So I said, sure, I got in the Jeep, and we drove up, and it didn't look terribly promising. There was a big earthen, uh, earthen berm there, and it had tar paper over it with rocks holding it down to protect it from the weather. And there was a very low door on one side. You had to duck way down in order to get in. 
When we went inside the door, much to my surprise, there was a beautiful place. It was decorated in a very fancy manner. It had a colored parachute for a ceiling. It had a nice bar, and there were small tables with chairs sitting around. And in fact, they had red-coated waiters taking, uh, taking your order. So I sat down. I met the, the uh, naval officer. I sat down. And I told him, I said, this is marvelous. How did you ever get this? Oh, he said, we had the sea bees do it. And apparently they had distracted the sea bees from their usual duties and put them over to building an officer's club. <coughs> and I told him, I thought that was marvelous that, uh, that they, could, uh, they could get first things first and get their officer's club in such great order, uh, have a complete bar operative and everything while the fighting was still going on up there. Well, we joked and had a good time for a little while, had a couple of drinks, and and came time to, uh, to go back home, so I got in the Jeep and went back. But I've often marveled that the Navy was able to do things like that. I don't think that I ever saw uh, a bar to equal that one uh, in a place where there was active fighting going on at any rate. In the meantime, uh, up uh, on Leyte, I had, uh, I found out after the war that my friend Pete Lee from Steelville, Missouri, had been in an outfit that was on that airfield. <clears throat> and he said that one day that a water buffalo had wandered out onto the airstrip and had interrupted operations. And uh, the uh, lieutenant for his outfit uh, became a little exasperated with trying to get this thing off. They'd been unable to chase it off the airstrip. So he told him to shoot it. And, uh, of course, what they should have done was just stung the animal so it would have wandered off, but they killed the animal and they dropped it right in the middle of the airstrip. Then they had a real problem, how they were going to get it off of the airstrip. Eventually they had to bring a piece of power equipment over and hook it up and drag the animal to the edge. He said that when they got it to the edge, the lieutenant said, I want you guys to dig a hole and bury this thing. Pete objected because he said they had had no fresh meat in weeks in his outfit, and he pulled his sharp knife out and demonstrated how to, how, to <coughs> how to butcher the animal on the spot, and his outfit enjoyed the feast that followed. When uh, you're flying into Lady, um, you're getting pretty close to the end of the war now, aren't you? Uh, how much time is left before the... Uh, Still they still have quite a few stories. You've got Okinawa, things. you've got... Uh... Uh, yeah, we well, some of the things in the, in the Philippines, Northern Phil Lady was just the beginning yeah. of the Philippines campaign. Uh, it would probably take me 20 minutes to get through Okinawa or thereabouts, if that's, uh, if that's suitable. I was just looking at our time. We've got 30 minutes left on this tape, and I don't yeah. have any more tapes. <laughs> all right. Well, let me see what I can do with 30 minutes. Okay. First of all, I'll tell you about a trip that I took over to uh, to uh, Mindoro in the western Philippines. Stayed overnight, went to breakfast in the morning. And uh, the, the eating facility was all covered with screen wire. Uh, I was sitting in the dark uh, eating when I... I heard a whining noise, and suddenly a, a wingtip light flashed by me right outside of the screen wire. It was, it was only a few feet away, and I heard a thud and scraping on the runway. I jumped up, and there was another pilot there with me. He did the same. We ran out. There was a P-38 with its, with its wheels up that had come in, and hit on the runway. Fortunately, it hadn't torn it up any more than it had. We ran out, and the uh, pilot was apparently unconscious. We opened the cockpit uh, and got to him, pulled him out, and dragged him out away from the airplane. After we got him out there, the airplane caught fire, and we found out at that point that he had a live 500-pound bomb sitting underneath the thing, <laughs> and we got away from it before it blew. <laughs> But, but then, uh, uh, as we moved into the northern Philippines campaign, the 
first thing I wanted to tell about was the relief of the Santa Toma University prison. Santa Toma University was just outside of Manila, and and the Japanese had threatened to kill the thousands of, of uh, people that they held prisoner there. Uh, they had al we'd already blown up all the airfields around Manila, so we didn't have a place to land. Uh, MacArthur sent a relief column to Santa Toma, opened it up, and we landed our aircraft on the highway along the southeast portion of Manila Bay. There was a, a large dual highway there. We landed them there and picked these people up and flew them out. And the unusual thing about this was that the, uh, the uh, one of the members of my Rotary Club in St. Louis, when he, when he was initially brought into the Rotary Club and was telling about his background, he said that he had started out life as a prisoner, that as a baby he had been at Santa Tomas University. And of course he was one of the people as a baby that we had carried out in our extraction raids. Uh, subsequent to that, uh, we were put on temporary duty uh, about 50 or 60 miles from Clark Field, up some distance north of Manila. And at that time, uh, by this time, I was, the, I was the flight leader of Flight D, and I gave a lot of the uh, a lot of the uh, instrument flight check rides and the check out rides for people becoming first pilot also I was giving and uh, our aircraft when we were putting a lot of time on them when we had to have engine changes the only engine change depot was in at Nichols Field in Manila because we were so short of pilots at this point in time again <coughs> they went ahead and authorized me to fly the C-46 and C-47 solo and uh, and I would, uh, I would go down to pick up the airplanes, for example, after they'd had an engine change. Um, on one occasion, I went over to Clark Field. The Philippine Airways, uh, civilian airlines, had been restarted. And on our way down, I was called up to the cockpit, uh, and the, uh, the captain of the airline said, I can't get the wheels down. He was flying a DC-3. He said, he said, you have experience in this airplane. And I said, yes, I've instructed in it. I said, all you do is put the airplane into a shallow dive, get good speed up, and then pull the nose up sharply while you throw the arm down for the, uh, uh, for the hydraulic pressure to the, to the gear. He looked at me kind of funny, crawled out of the pilot's seat, and said, you do it. So I got in, and I put the airline's nose down, and I shook the wheels down, and I started to crawl out of the seat, and we were almost to Manila at this point. And he looked at me, he said, you landed too. <laughs> so I always laughed. It's a rare opportunity for you to go on an airline flight someplace and end up being the guy who lands the airplane. Now that was with the, the Manila Airlines? Well, I can't tell you the name of the airlines. We were flying mostly C-46s like this uh, at that time. Most of our C-47s were gone, but it was one of the civilian airlines uh, uh, out, of, uh, out of Manila. Now, so, just so people know, this is your C-46 right here. That's correct. And that's about twice as big an airplane. It was the largest twin-engine land plane in the world when it was first built. And it carried a load over twice of what the, twice what the C-47 would carry. And it would carry it longer distances. It was a much more capable airplane on one engine. So this was, in my opinion, it did have Curtis Electric propellers, which we regretted because we had problems with those, and the later models came out with Hamilton Standard hydraulic propellers and a much better model. They also, they also redid the, uh, the hydraulic uh, servo system for the airplane's controls in the later models, and they, they used a servo tab instead, which uh, did not have the maintenance problems. Now, what are you hearing about how the war is going? And all right, the war was the war was getting tough up in Okinawa. The Japanese were getting much harder to dislodge, and they were using kamikaze pilots to and sink our ships and things. We flew in and out of Naha from the Naha was the first trip that was opened up there, and we flew in and out of that from the time it opened. Also, one day 
I was on a trip going back toward Biak. I was heading east from the Philippines and not too far from the Philippines. I had Armed Forces radio on. They came in with a bulletin that a new kind of bomb had been dropped on the city of Hiroshima and they went on to say it was an atomic bomb. Fortunately, I knew about this because I had a chemistry professor who had told us about it when I was in college before I went in service about theoretically how this material could be used to make an atomic bomb. And I did understand what it was about and I was absolutely elated because I thought this will bring the war to an end. The Japanese were slow to respond to this so we dropped a second one on Nagasaki and with that the emperor interfered with the warlords and told them that they had to, they had to settle this. I was uh, in Manila, I saw the Japanese uh, uh, military people come in to sue for peace. It was the first Japanese airplane I saw land without anybody shooting at it or getting after it. And very shortly after that it happened. Since we're running just a little bit low on time, I may go ahead and move forward to uh, my entry to Japan because that was a, a particular particularly difficult problem and, and probably the most dangerous thing that I ever did in service. Uh, we, uh, we did not have any weather services or uh, even recent maps of Japan and our squadron was told that we were to go up almost immediately after the peace and take over at Sugi Airdrome which was, Jap was the Tokyo International Airport. Uh, we left from uh, Okinawa and we had been given a drawing of how we should make an instrument approach if we ran into bad weather because they had no knowledge of what the weather was up there. We had sent uh, a C-47 ahead with a beacon on it and we had the frequency for the beacon so that we could locate it. On my way up, looking over my maps, I had a map that I had purchased in Australia. It was an Australian map of Japan and the Tokyo area. I matched it with what I had been given by the Air Corps and it did not match. The hills were located in different spots, including one that was directly in the way of the proposed instrument approach that they asked us to make. We had broken up and gone our, own, our separate ways because we had gone into bad weather and we were in solid instruments with rain and I tried to contact the other two pilots with three aircraft had taken off. I tried to contact the other two pilots and I was unsuccessful. I thought about it on the way up and decided that it was dangerous either way to approach and, and it was too far up there to turn around and come back too by the time we were really in the, in the weather. So I made a decision on my own that I was not going to use their instrument approach. Instead, I flew south far enough so that I was sure that I was clear of land, uh, of the Japanese land, Japanese coast. And when I was over the sea, I let down, I had been at fairly high altitude, I think maybe 10 or 12,000 feet, which was high at that time. Had gone down all the way and more slowly as I got lower until I finally broke out and I could see the ocean underneath me. I was about 400 feet over the ocean and just under the cloud deck and it was raining. The visibility was not very good. I angled in from that point toward the Japanese mainland and so that I wouldn't overrun the beach when I found it. And when I found it, I turned parallel with the beach and flew along until I found the exit of the river that, that flowed from north to south and out into the ocean at that point. That river was only a few miles west of Atsugi Airdrome. So I flew up the river and tuned in the homing beacon, identified it, and when I got opposite it, I turned. There were big clouds rolling on the ground so that I was only seeing the ground intermittently as I went as I went along. But I spotted the aerodrome and the and the uh, landing strip and I landed. The other two aircraft that I took off with uh, from Okinawa did not make it. They never showed up. 
And the next day, I, I told them up at our squadron headquarters what I had done, and I was suspicious that the, the American map might be wrong. So they sent me out to look on the, on the, on the hillside, and both airplanes had crashed on that hillside trying to make that approach. So I've, I've, I've turned in the accident report on that. But my immediate assignment then, I was given a squad of, of Marines and told to go to Seoul, Korea and get the Japanese Governor General and his government and bring them back to Tokyo. I asked them if we were in control of Korea, and they said no, that we were not in control yet, but the Japanese Governor General had agreed to come peaceably. So I went, I stayed overnight. Uh, I, as far as I remember, I was the only airplane on Kimpo Aerodrome at the time. And the, <coughs> and the Japanese came down with steamer trunks and this sort of thing. We filled the big C-46 full of this stuff. My crew, unfortunately, got some ideas about getting some, uh, some souvenirs. And uh, I found out about it in the middle of the night and, uh, and got them all out of bed and told them to get up and put everything back exactly where they found it, which was a good thing because there was some news reporter came out with the Japanese Governor General in the, mortar in the morning and wanted to know about the pilfering of, the, of his things <laughs> that had been reported to have occurred. And I told them there was nothing pilfered. They could check for everything and they would find it, and they did. So we brought him back. And, and I made many other trips in the Japanese area. My other really great historic trip, though, was to Hiroshima. Uh, and uh, Dave Glasscock, who was my roommate and the, the operations officer, I think made the first trip down there. I think I made the second. I took some scientists with me to measure radioactivity. And they told me I carried equipment and walked the streets of Hiroshima they told me that, uh, the, that the radioactivity in Hiroshima on that day was lower than it was in Times Square in New York, which they explained was because it was an air blast and it had all been blown away. Nothing was left radioactive, and people who said that they were injured by radioactivity that occurred weeks and months after the dropping of the atomic bomb are all wet. They did not get radioactivity from the atomic bomb. And <laughs> Uh, also, I found there was a, a giant wall that surrounded the old part of the city of Hiroshima, and only the portions within the wall were wiped out. It was like a firestorm had cleaned it out. There were no big bomb craters or things like that. The streets were more or less intact, and the pipes stuck up where there had been Japanese residences. But outside of the walls, Nobody got radiated, and their homes didn't get blown away either. The real, <clears throat> the real damage that I saw was within the walls, which was possibly an area, it might have been two miles each way, four square miles or so. I may be a little off on that because these are guesses. I didn't have actual numbers to go by, or I didn't have the opportunity to measure some of these things. Uh, following that, we toured portions of Japan. I got to see the Imperial Hotel in Tokyo that Frank Lloyd Wright designed. I was fascinated with that. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I found a 1936 Chevrolet which had been converted to operate on, uh, on gases uh, from, a, from a, a cooker that used uh, coal and that sort of thing. And we had plenty of gasoline, so I took that off, converted it back to gasoline, and we used it to travel that whole whole area around Tokyo, Yokohama, and up toward Atsugi, and, and so on. I had a lot more material on this that I won't have time for about the Japanese people who were, who were uh, dressed in traditional Japanese garments when we got there, and within three months they were wearing Western clothes again. So anybody who missed the first, first six weeks up there never saw Japan in traditional garments and attire. So, you get orders at some point to go back to the states. Yes, as a matter of fact, we were to we were to move we were to go back to Manila, and I was in command of the squadron taking it back from Atsugi to Manila, 
we ran into a horrendous storm. It was a typhoon, really. Uh, as we approached Okinawa, we had to land on seven different airfields, but we didn't damage any airplanes. And we went on to there from Manila. Uh, from there, I have a little story. If we have time for it, I have to tell you that uh, that we got a, a northern. We had no trips. We had no flying. Everybody was kind of at wit's ends down there, and we'd go out and drink at night. But we got one order in for a trip to go all the way to Sydney, Australia. This was between Christmas and New Year's in 1945. And I wanted in the worst way to go, as every other pilot did. However, my, my, uh, uh, the operations officer was my best buddy. He held the drawing and I won. And they all cried foul. They said that he had <laughs> done something wrong. In fact, they raised so much cane that, they, that <laughs> he finally said he was absolutely forced to have another drawing. So that time he brought all the pilots in who wanted to come in. He filled his hat with all these slips of paper. He had one of the other pilots draw a slip out, and what do you know, my name was on it. Years later he told me that he put my name on every slip that went in it because it made him so mad they had questioned it. And, and we were to go down to get flour for the bakery, and we took off and we ran because we found out that that the ship that was supposed to bring the flour in had been sighted and we knew they would call us back. We made it all the way to Sydney before we, before we would contact them back and tell them where we were. And when we got there, I told the crew chief that I didn't see any, any reason why we should go back in a hurry, that if he found anything wrong with the airplane, he should report it. He came back 15 minutes later and said, Sir, he said, I dropped the battery 14 feet to the tarmac. He said, we don't have a battery for this airplane. <laughs> so we were in Sydney for New Year's of 1946. I had a date with Miss Australia of 1945, went to some nice parties and everything, had a marvelous time down there. And, uh, and uh, when I got back, uh, my orders uh, were there that we would be leaving to come back to the States. And I made a decision at that point, that instead of flying an airplane, I'd never been on a uh, on a real ship ride, ocean ride. So I got some books and and Glasscock and a couple of other guys uh, from my outfit uh, decided we were going on this ship. We got on the USS General Han, which departed Manila. I think it was the twenty twentieth of uh, I think it was the twentieth of January and it held 5,000 troops. I had these books I was going to read. I was really set for a genuine cruise. I walked up the gangplank and they called me aside and said, sir, we have some orders for you. And I opened them up and I was in command of the 5,000 troops on board. And it kind of screwed up my, <laughs> my plans for a, for a sea voyage, but we <laughs> We only got into one big trouble, and that is that the Navy had a bunch of guys that wanted to come home too, and they got on this ship first and took over a bunch of the bunks we were supposed to have. The captain didn't want to do anything about it, so I got all of our out guys together, and at one time we all marched into the ship's office, set up housekeeping, put our helmets on the desks to shave in the morning and everything, and the captain couldn't stand it any longer. He said, okay, I'll get those guys out. And he got the, he got the Navy guys out of the bunks so that our people could get in their bunks and we could get our bunks back. Uh, when we came into San Francisco Harbor, it was a very emotional kind of thing. I, I didn't know that I would be broken up that much by watching it. When we came under the Golden Gate Bridge, they had these, all these fire boats and everything came out with their, with their hoses shooting in the air and uh, playing martial music for us and things. And, girls on all the boats waving and, and this sort of thing. Uh, and uh, we, uh, uh, we landed, got things together, and, and I was sent to Fort Leavenworth for, uh, for separation. And I was separated there, given train tickets back to Des Moines. Uh, got, uh, got into Des Moines. Uh, it was, uh, it was, uh, in February, mid-February, very much winter time, and in the things that I put together on this, I said that uh, that uh, I arrived in Ames, Iowa, a 
three years older and, and much wiser than the 18-year-old that had shipped off to war from the Ames City Hall with his tearful mother <laughs> standing by. Now, at what point do you elect to go into medical school and become a doctor? Well, I'd already made up my mind at that point I probably would do that. If I couldn't do that, I had all the qualifications to be an airline pilot. My primary flight instructor was right. I had about 1,800 hours, almost all of it, in transports, uh, and I was, a, I was a senior pilot and, uh, and, uh, and an instructor, uh, and, uh, and I, was, uh, I was an instrument flight examiner. I don't think an airline would have turned me down if they had a job available. Not in those days. And I had a perfectly clean record all the way. But I really wanted to go to medical school. So the first thing I did was to go over uh, to the people at Iowa State University and ask them whether they thought that I had everything I needed to, to go to medical school to make it all right. I had a year of engineering at that time. And they gave me a bunch of tests and everything and said, there's no reason you can't uh, you can't go to medical school if you want to. So I went back to work in order to enhance my chances of getting into medical school. I, I did some research work which was published and that that helped me a lot because uh, at, uh, at Washington University when I went where I went to medical school they had 4,500 applications for 86 openings and it was very difficult to, to get in. It, of course that was one of the one of the best schools and even the lower schools, though, were almost as hard to get into. So where do you meet your wife in these? <laughs> my, wife, my wife came, I went to St. Louis to go to medical school. Uh, my, uh, my, wife, uh, my wife came to St. Louis to teach mathematics at John Burroughs School. It's a private school, uh, a, little bit, uh, a little bit classy private school in St. Louis. And she had her master's degree in mathematics education from Columbia University in New York and, and was uh, uh, and would not have come to the Midwest except that her head professor at, at Columbia told her that this was a great place that she ought to go there and have the experience of teaching under, under uh, a man by the name of Heritor who was then the, uh, the headmaster at John Burroughs School. And my f best friend in college had been on some social probation and thought he wasn't going to be able to get into medical school that year until he got off social probation at any rate. So he stayed on, worked on his master's, did some more research. And I went to the dean's office at Washington University and went to bat for him and recommended that they at least give him an interview, which they did. He came down, he got married to his girlfriend before he came down. His girlfriend was a home economics graduate, and John Burroughs School needed a home economics graduate to run their food service and teach home economics classes. So my, uh, my good turn for him turned into a good turn for me. And uh, we, still see, we still see my friends, the Brody, Lois and Chuck Brodine. He became the hematologist for Bethesda Naval Hospital in Washington. And after that, he was the doctor for the Secretary of State and traveled all over the world. And we still see them frequently. So how many children did you have? We have five and 12 grandchildren. And? And the, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, none of the grandchildren live in St. Louis. The oldest boy is a PhD electrical engineer physicist. He was on the faculty at Stanford, research faculty for a time, and he worked for Hewlett Packard for years. And still, and now he's working for Agilent Technologies. Second boy is a uh, is a medical doctor. He uh, he's a cardiologist and uh, he does in basic cardiology work. He was on the faculty at Washington University in St. Louis, and then he went into practice in Virginia Beach on the you know, on the East Coast. And we have one unmarried son in St. Louis. He's a, he was educated as a chemist, but he. He's running a, 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 a he's running a, a service where he delivers packages and things of this sort at this time. Uh, fourth child is a, a girl, Christine. She's a chemical engineer. She was in charge of all 
all of the environmental services for Phillips Petroleum for a time. But she has three children, so she quit and started teaching school because that would match their program a lot better. And she didn't need to be in the North Sea inspecting an oil rig when she had a sick kid at home. I applauded her for doing that, even though she took a big salary cut in it. And, uh, and the uh, fifth is also a girl, and uh, she's an architect in, in the Oklahoma City area. And she also has children and is not doing much architecture right now. Now, mm, we're getting near the end, but one last story. The Butch O'Hara family was patients of yours, right? Yes. Butch O'Hara, as you know, was the first big hero of World War II. Uh, he, he saved his aircraft carrier when he and two other fighters were in the air. The other two, their guns wouldn't work, and he personally shot down uh, and turned back a flight of some, I think it was around 12 Japanese aircraft that he turned around and kept them from attacking his carrier. He came back and then later went back into night fighter things and was killed late in the war. Uh, his, he was from St. Louis. Uh, his mother was a patient of mine. Uh, his sisters were, were both patients of mine at one time or another. And, uh, and uh, uh, Butch, uh, uh, Butch's mother was approached by the St. Louis people who wanted to name their airport after him. She said she thought that was inappropriate, that it was, it was putting down the mothers of other, other people who lost their lives that just didn't get all that publicity. So they didn't. Chicago didn't even ask her. They went ahead and named O'Hare International Airport for him without ever asking his mother. And the reason that they did it, though, was that his father had, had, had been the, uh, a young lawyer who went to work for Al Capone's organization, apparently not realizing what he was getting into. He ran the dog tracks for them, and he kept track of the bookkeeping and everything, turned the materials over to the government, and Al Capone was convicted and put in jail for tax evasion, not for all the other bad things that he did. The day Al Capone was, uh, got out of jail in Chicago, Eddie O'Hare, which his father, was shot down on the streets of Chicago by the gang. And City Hall decided uh, as uh, a, a, a something for the family that they were going to name their new international airport for his son, Butch O'Hare. That is how that came about. Very interesting. Well, it certainly has uh, been my pleasure to go through this. I know there were other things to talk about, but um, it has been a great uh, time for me, and I certainly enjoyed it, and I want to thank you for coming here. You people are doing a marvelous job with these things, and I don't know how you put up with long-winded people like me, because uh, I, I'm afraid that I probably run the tape out to the last <laughs> inch. <laughs> well, we, if it helps, we still have three minutes left. <laughs> well, I have to tell you that I made a trip back to, to Australia and New Zealand uh, about ten years ago, and I took my wife to see the Pacific Rim. Among other things, we took a flight up to, to Port Moresby, New Guinea. I did this because I had a patient come in my, my office who worked for the Chart and Information Center in St. Louis. He had previously been a pilot in the Air Force. And, <clears throat> and uh, I asked him what a pilot did at the Chart and Information Center if they had made a cartographer of it. He said no, he was their expert on New Guinea. And I said, well, that's amazing. Have you ever been there? And he said, no. I, he said, but I know a lot about it. You can't ask me very many questions I can't answer. I said, well, what's, what's new there? He said, name a couple of places, and I'll tell you about them. I said, Mount Hagen. He said, oh, that's the place up in the mountains. And he said, he said they have three or four airplanes that are based there, and they have so many hundred gallons of gasoline, hundred octane gasoline, so many hundred gallons of jet fuel. He said, how am I doing? I said, okay, now tell me about NADZAP. Oh, he said, they just finished a new superhighway from NADZAP to Ley. Ley is on the east coast. I said, a superhighway for what? I said, those are Stone Age people down there. They don't even have wheels. They don't know, they wouldn't know what to do. He said, you're behind times. They've been modernized. They now drive cars. And I said, not only that, you can't speak to them. There were 700 tribes on New Guinea, and they spoke 700 different languages. 
He said, not anymore. They have compulsory English, have compulsory elementary education, and they speak English. I said, I have to see this. Those guys were little guys five feet tall with bones in their noses, and they didn't wear any clothes except they put a gourd over their penis, and the, and the, the women might wear a little grass skirt at times with their breasts hanging out. So we went to Port Moresby, and he was right. These people have grown six or seven inches in height. I guess they've gotten rid of all of their worms and things, and they fed them. Not only that, they were wearing Western clothes. They speak English. Went into Port Moresby, which was nothing when I was there. There weren't even streets. There were just dirt paths and, and some native huts down there and three or four, uh, three or four Kwanzaa huts. And after looking at over, it is now a city of 150,000 people with high-rise steel and glass buildings. Every bank in the Pacific is represented in Port Moresby because New Guinea is the large, second largest island in the world and it has more natural resources than you can imagine. Gold and copper and oil and all of these things. We'll hear from New Guinea in the future, but it's not the New Guinea that I knew. Again, thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.